Chapter One of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Frank Lennon. On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. New York to Londonderry. At New York on the 26th of June, we boarded the SS Columbia, the new twin screw steamer of the anchor line. Every berth was taken, and as the passengers were a bright set on pleasure bent, there was an entire absence of formality and exclusiveness. They sang, danced, and amused themselves in many original ways while the Columbia reeled off the knots with a clock like regularity, very agreeable to the experienced travellers on board. As our destination was Londonderry, we took a northerly course, which brought us into floating ice fields and among schools of porpoises and whales. In fact, it was an uneventful day on which some passenger could not boast of having seen a spouter just a few minutes ago. We celebrated the morning of the 4th of July in a very pretentious way, with a procession of the nations in costume and burlesques on the conditions of the day. The writer was cast to represent the Beef Trust, and at £225 the selection met with popular approval. But he found a passenger of £35 more in the foreground, and thereupon retired to the sidelines. Attorney Grant of New York made a striking Rob Roy, with his colossal Corinthian pillars in their natural condition. A long list of games and a variety of races for prizes gave us a lively afternoon, and the evening wound up with a grand concert at which Professor Green of Yale made an excellent comic oration. W. A. Ross of New York was my companion on the trip. A. B. Hepburn, ex-controller of the currency, intended going with us, but was prevented at the last moment by pressure of business, which we very much regretted. The steamer soon sighted Tory Island, rapidly passed Malin Head, and then turned into Loch Foyle. When a few miles inside the mouth of the latter, we stopped at Mouville, and the passengers for Ireland were sent up to Londonderry on a tender. We were so far north, and the date was so near the longest day, that we could easily read a paper at midnight, and, as we did not get through customs until 4 a.m., we did not go to bed, but went to a hotel and had breakfast instead. The Custom House examination at Derry, conducted under the personal direction of a collector, is perhaps the most exasperating ordeal of its kind to be found in any port in existence. The writer has passed through almost all the important custom houses in the world, and has never seen such a display of inherent meanness as was shown by this collector. He seized with glee and charged duty upon a single package of cigarettes belonging to a passenger, and he nabbed another man with a quarter pound of tobacco, thereby putting an extra shilling into his king's pocket. He was an Irish imitation Englishman and his haches dropped on the dock like a shower of peas when he directed his understrappers in a husky squeak how best to trap the passengers. The owner of the quarter-pound of tobacco poured out the vials of his wrath on the collector afterwards at the hotel. I would give a five-pound note to get him in some quiet place and pull his parrot nose was the way he wound up his invective. Neither were the ladies allowed to escape, their clothing being shaken out in quest of tobacco and spirits, since those are about the only articles upon which duty is charged. The very last cigar was extracted by long and bony fingers from its cosy resting place in the vest pocket of a passenger who shall be nameless. Hence these tears. All other ports in Europe vie with one another in liberal treatment of the tourist. They want his gold. The writer landed both at Southampton and Dover last summer, and at the latter place, although there were over five hundred trunks and satchels on the steamer, not one was opened. 
nor was a single passenger asked a question. Smuggling means the sale at a profit of goods brought into the port for that purpose. Nothing from America can be sold at a profit, unless it be steel rails, and they are much too long to carry in a trunk. We are now in Derry, as it is called in Ireland, and every man in it is town proud, and well they may be. As Derry has a historical record second to but few cities in any country, and its siege is perhaps the most celebrated in history. At this writing it has a population of 33,000, and is otherwise prosperous. St. Columba started it in 546 AD by building his abbey. Then came the deadly Dane invader, swooping down on this and other foil settlements, and glutting his savage appetite for plunder. Out of the ruins left by the Danes arose, in 1164, the great abbey of Abbot O'Brooklawn, who was at that time made the first bishop of Derry. The English struggled and fought for centuries to gain a foothold in this part of Ireland, but to no purpose until Sir Henry Docrora landed, about 1600 A.D., on the banks of the Foyle, with a force of 4,000 men and 200 horse. He restored Fort Culmore, and took Derry, destroyed all the churches, the stones of which were used for building fortifications, and left standing only the tower of the cathedral, which remained until after the siege. In 1608, Sir Cahar O'Doherty of Inishon, who at first had favoured the settlement, rebelled, took Culmore Fort, and burnt Derry. His death, and the flight of the earls to Rhone and Tyrconnell to France, left Derry and other vast possessions to English confiscation, over 200,000 acres alone falling to the citizens of London. The walls were built in 1609 and still remain in good condition, being used as a promenade. The original guns bristle from loopholes at intervals, and Roaring Meg will always have a place in history for the loud crack she made when fired on the enemy. She sits at the base of Walker's Monument, now silent but still ugly. This monument is erected on a column ninety feet high, starting from a bastion on the wall, and has a statue of Walker on its summit. One of the earliest feats in sightseeing which the writer ever accomplished was to climb to its top up a narrow flight of spiral stairs. There would not be room enough for him in it now, James I granted a new charter of incorporation to Derry in 1613, and changed the name from Derry Column Kill to Londonderry. James II laid siege to the town in person in 1689, but failed to capture it. It was defended for 105 days by its citizens under George Walker. But 2,000 of them lost their lives from wounds and starvation. On the 28th of July, the ships Mountjoy and Phoenix, by gallantly rushing in concert against the iron boom laid across the foil, broke it, and relieved the starving people with plenty of provisions, and so the siege was ended. There are seven gates in the walls of Derry. Bishop's Gate, Shipkey Gate, Butcher's Gate, New Gate, Ferry Gate, Castle Gate, and the Northern Gate, a recent addition. Those favourites of fortune who live near New York know that George Washington had some 250 headquarters and places where he once stopped, in and about the city, and that he sat in over 2,000 armchairs in them. Or at least that number has been sold with the genial auctioneer's guarantee of their authenticity. It is estimated that it would require a train of 25 freight cars to carry the chairs, desks, haircloth sofas, saddlebags, guns, and pistols that have been sold as relics from his headquarters at Madame Jumel's alone, Harlem absorbing 75% of this output. But for all that, King James runs George a close second. The writer is only one man, yet he has slept in three 
Honduras mahogany four posters in which James preceded him has eaten with many knives that swept the royal mouth and today owns a bone handled razor that is said to have scraped the face of royalty and yet after all he's only comparatively happy end of new york to london dairy chapter two of on an Irish jaunting car through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Londonderry to Port Salon. We leave Derry with regret and take the train to Fahan. This brings us to the shores of Loch Swilly, where we embark on a ferry boat and crossed the loch to Rathmullen. While crossing, I saw Buncrana, a short distance down the loch. This is a pretty village containing the castle of the Adorities, now in ruins, and near it the castle erected by Sir John Vaughan at a later period. Half a century ago, the latter became dilapidated, but it was restored and has since been rented for the season as an investment by the owner. One of my pleasantest recollections is the week's end visit I made many years ago to its then tenant. It had fine terraced gardens, its outer walls were skirted by a trout and salmon river, and there was a vast courtyard behind it with cell stalls for the cavalry horses and even a gallows on which to hang captured invaders, and many of them were hanged on this same gallows. It was not a pleasant outlook from one's bedchamber window, but then the victims had been a long time dead, and no trouble came from their ghosts. We soon arrived at Rathmullen, a historic spot where many things happened in the days of yore. It occupies a sheltered position at the foot of a range of hills that intervene between Loch Swilly and Mulroy Bay, of which the highest point is Crocanaphrin, 1137 feet. It is worth while to make an excursion either up this hill or Crohan, 1010 feet, which is nearer, for the extraordinary view over the inlets and indentations of this singular coast will put the traveller more in mind of Norwegian fjords than British scenery. Close to it are the ivy-clad ruins of a priory of Carmelite friars, consisting of two distinct buildings erected at intervals of nearly two centuries, the eastern portion of which the tower and chancel remain was constructed by the McSweeney's in the 15th century. It exhibits considerable traces of pointed Gothic architecture. Over the eastern window there still remains a figure of St. Patrick. The architecture of the remainder of the building is of the Elizabethan age, a great part of it having been rebuilt by Bishop Knox of the Diocese of Rapo in 1618 on obtaining possession of the manor of Rathmullen from Turlock Og McSweeney. The annals of the four masters to which we will refer later states that in 1595 it was plundered by George Bingham, son of the Governor of Connacht. Maxweeney's castle is supposed to have stood west of the Priory, but it was destroyed in 1516. It was from here that the young Hugh O'Donnell was carried off in 1587 and kept a prisoner in Dublin until he made his romantic escape in 1591. In 1607, the Earls of Tyrone and Tyrconnell took their flight from Rathmullen in a small vessel. The entire number on board was 99, having little sea store and being otherwise miserably accommodated. After a hazardous voyage of three weeks, they landed at the mouth of the Seine. There is a monument in the courtyard to the memory of the Honourable William H. Pakenham, 
captain of the British man of war Saldana, wrecked on Swilly Rock in 1811. Every soul on board was lost. The only living thing that reached the land was the captain's grey parrot, which the wind carried in safety to the rocks. Here, too, Wolf Tone was taken prisoner on board the French frigate Ouche in 1798. Tone was a talented young Irishman and pleaded the Irish cause so eloquently in Paris that a fleet of 43 ships with 15,000 men was sent to Ireland in 1796, Ouche commanding. A tremendous storm scattered the fleet on the Irish coast and the ships returned to France in broken order. Nothing daunted, Tone again persuaded the French to give him a trial with a new fleet. They gave it, but this expedition was even more unfortunate than the first one, and the end of Tone's tragic career dated from his arrest on the shores of Loch Swilly. A few miles above, Loch Swilly divides into two forks, one running up to Letter Kenny and another to Ramelton a little town located at the point where the river Lennon meets the tidal salt water. This interesting place is celebrated for the fine views it affords and for its salmon and trout fishing. I was exceedingly anxious to visit it, but time would not permit the shortest deviation from our rigid itinerary, as we had purchased a stateroom on the Utroria, sailing from Queenstown, on July the 28th. It was at Rathmullen that we hired our first jaunting car, and it might here be said that of all the vehicles ever invented, the modern Irish jaunting car holds first place for the use of the traveller. It is unique, and there is nothing that can take its place for an easy and comfortable lounging ride, when balanced by two passengers and a driver. It is now improved with a circular back and rubber tyres, while the very latest has a driver's seat behind, like a hansom cab. We can speak truthfully of the jaunting car after having tested its qualities for 350 miles on this trip, but would add that care is requisite in arranging for and selecting a car, as many of them are old and worn out. End of Londonderry to Port Salon Chapter 3 of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon Port Salon to Dunfanaghy Leaving Rathmullen, John, our driver, took us a short cut over the Glenalla Mountains to Port Salon, through Mr. Hart's domain of fine timber. As we drove along, our interest was excited by the masses of firs to be seen on all sides. This shrub grows about five feet high, and is thickly covered with sharp, dark green prickles, and innumerable flowers of the brightest yellow known to botanists. Its popular name is Wynn, and it is extensively used as food for their horses by the farmers, who pound the prickles into pulp in a stone trough, and when so prepared, the horses eat them with great relish. Wynns grow all over the north of Ireland in wild profusion, and the startling blaze of their yellow bloom may be seen for miles. To those not accustomed to their beauty, they are a most interesting novelty. After driving about twenty miles through this kind of country, we arrived at Colonel Barton's handsome hotel, on the bluffs of Loch Swilly, at the point where it opens into the Atlantic. I can hardly describe the beauty of this spot. Its hard, yellow strand, its savage mountains covered with blooming heather, its sapphire sea in strong contrast to the deep 
rich green pines. The Atlantic was booming into the numerous caves that line both sides of the loch, and so seductive was the influence of this sound that at our first view we lay down, tired and happy, in the deep heather, and fell asleep for an hour, undisturbed by fly, mosquito, or gnat. A British ironclad was anchored a little above, which gave a note of distinction to the charming scene. We were told it was the celebrated Camperdown that did the ramming in the Mediterranean disaster. We stayed overnight and made an excursion next morning to the Seven Arches. This is a short and interesting trip, about a mile and a half north of the hotel. Here is a series of fine caverns scooped out of the limestone rock by the action of the waves, which can be easily reached by land, but the approach by water is grander and more imposing. From the strand where the boat deposits the visitor. A cave with a narrow entrance runs over 130 feet inland, and beyond this are the seven arches, one of which forming a grand entrance from the sea, 100 yards long, divides into two. Beyond the left-hand cave is another, 120 feet long, the right-hand cave is again divided into four beautiful caverns, through any one of which a passage may be made to the boulder strand, whence another arch leads towards the north. We left Colonel Barton's and drove along the coast for a few miles to Dunbeg, where we stopped to admire a magnificent sea arch called Brown George. The most remarkable natural feature, perhaps, on the whole coast of Loch Swilly. Dunbeg is a very primitive native village, and is the capital of the district called Fanet, or sometimes Fanad. This was the birthplace of the Honourable P. C. Boyle, who had made his mark in Pennsylvania. Further driving brought us to Fanet Head, one of the most northerly points in Ireland on which is erected a large lighthouse, 127 feet above high water. This has a group of occulting lights, showing white to seaward and red towards land. After inspecting the lighthouse, we took our last look at Loch Swilly. The Lake of Shadows, with its marvellous scenic splendour, almost unrivalled also as a safe and deep harbour. I have seen the British fleet manoeuvre in its confines, and it could easily anchor every man of war in commission today, giving them all enough cable to swing clear of one another on the tide. We coasted the Atlantic for a few miles and then turned into the hills that surround Mulroy Bay, which soon came into sight. When we reached the shore, a council of war was held, and it was decided to save some twenty miles of driving up around the head of the bay by crossing, if possible, at the lower end. So a broad, heavy, but unseaworthy boat was chartered, and we took Bob, the horse, out of the car and rolled the latter into the stern of our marine transport. It was no easy task to get Bob to face the water. However, after beating about the bush for half an hour, he suddenly grew tractable, and we pushed him into the boat by main strength. The passage was ludicrous in the extreme. At every high wave, Bob would lash out his heels and prance. The captain of the boat, who, by the way, was an Irish woman, would berate John for owning a horse whose temper was so bad that he might plunge us all into eternity without a minute's notice. John kept whispering in a loud voice into his horse's ear promises of oats, turnips, and a bran mash by way of dessert, if he would only behave himself. The tide was running strong, 
and we were swept past our landing. We each became captain in turn without appointment, and a variety of language was indulged in that would have made the Tower of Babel seem like a Quaker meeting. The farce was suddenly ended by Bob's breaking loose from his owner and jumping ashore like a chamois. We then ran the boat aground, took out the car, and after capturing Bob, with the promise of oats, were soon on our way again. In a short time after gaining starting, we ascended a hill and could clearly see the spot where Lord Leitrim was assassinated in April 1878. It lay up the bay in a clump of woods, close to the water. Lord Leitrim had been very harsh with his tenants, and had evicted large numbers of them from their farms. They therefore determined to remove him, and a select band of them lay in ambush along the road and successfully killed his lordship, his driver, and his secretary while they were driving to Derry. There were many trials in court, but those arrested could never be convicted. As a boy, I have been more than once startled by the appearance of a pair of cars with eight men in them, each having a couple of double-barreled shotguns. Lord Leitrim was one of them. The others were his guards, going to Milford to collect the rents. His temper was so violent that the government removed him from the office of magistrate. His son, the late Earl, was a very different kind of man. He did everything within his power to advance his tenant's interest. After his death a few years ago, the tenancy erected a fine monument to his memory in Carrigard Square. We later read the inscription upon it, which was, He loved his people. After a pleasant drive, we reached Carrigart, and had a good lunch there. We tried the Carrigart Perfectos afterwards, and their memory clings to us still. We then started for the Rossapenna Hotel, which was not far distant, less than two miles. This hotel was built of wood, after the Scandinavian fashion, by the trustees of the late Earl of Leitrim, and opened in 1893. It was designed in Stockholm, whence the timber was shipped to Mulroy. It stands at the base of Gainmore Mountain, on the narrow neck of the Rossgull Peninsula, between Mulroy Bay and Sheephaven. Fine golf links have been laid out with the eighteen holes, the circuit being three miles and a half. For visitors there is excellent fishing in the adjacent waters by permission of the Countess of Leitrim, and good bathing on the strands of Sheephaven, which afford a smooth promenade of six miles. From the top of Gainmore, a good view is obtained of the coast, from Hornhead around to Inishon Peninsula, and from its hills a fine sweep inland to Erigal Mountain. At Downings Bay there is one of the finest views of Donegal, looking up and down Sheep Haven, the woods of Ards and the tower of Doe Castle, backed up in the distance by the ponderous mass of Muckish. Within a short distance of the hotel there are three caves which can be entered, one from the brow of the hill and the others at low water. Near it also is Mulroy House, the residence of the Countess of Leitrim. From Rossapenna we drove to Doe Castle, built on the shores of Sheephaven. This was a stronghold of the McSweeney's, which had been, to a certain extent, modernised and rendered habitable by a late owner, who is in doing so pulls down some of the walls. It consists of a lofty keep with massive walls which enclose passages and stone stairs. It is surrounded by a bawn or castle yard, defended by a high wall with round towers at intervals. The rock on which it stands is not very high, but from its almost insulated position, it was difficult to approach. 
It was garrisoned by Captain Vaughan for Queen Elizabeth, but was betrayed to the followers of Sir Cahar O'Doherty. It was besieged in 1608, and Davis says, being the strongest in Tyrconnell, it endured 100 blows of the demi cannon before it surrendered. A little to the north, but separated by a prolongation of the marsh at the head of Sheephaven, is Ard's House, owned by Alexander J. R. Stewart. This domain is fenced with a cut stone wall which we skirted for many miles. It is a great show place with its extensive mansion, fine gardens and beautiful woods, fronting on the bay where the Lacag River runs into it. We drew rein on the Lacag Bridge to see Mr. Stewart's men draw a net with 800 pounds of salmon in it. There were almost 80 in the hall. William Ray, the oldest master of arts in the 18th century, had a strange history. He lived here in luxurious state and dispensed hospitality with true regal splendor. His ambition, indeed, appeared to be to see daily as much eaten as possible and to facilitate the arrival of guests. He engineered a road over Salt Mountain. Extravagance, however, at last told its tale, and the old man broke down, went over to France, where he died, poor, unfriended, and forgotten. After crossing the bridge, we took up the road to Cresla, where Balfour is building a narrow-gauge railroad for the purpose of giving employment to the poor, and by driving till quite late, we reached Dunfanaghy. A great day's work, as John put it, while cracking his whip during the last half mile. End of Port Salon to Dunfanaghy of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Dunfanaghy to Falcara. We put up at the Stuart Arms, and next morning, when we looked over the town, we came to the conclusion that Paris had nothing to fear from Dunfanaghy. It hasn't even a Moulin Rouge to boast of, but it's a first-class place to sleep in when you're worn out on the road, as we were. We engaged a large boat with four men to row us out into the Atlantic to see the famous Horn Head from the sea. The sight has really no equal anywhere. The writer, having seen it many times since boyhood, is more impressed with it on each occasion and this last time it seemed more entrancing than ever. Hornhead is a range of beetling mountains projecting into the Atlantic, and covers in extent some ten miles. The crags and horns are 626 feet high, and are of all colours of the rainbow, from the deepest black to red, yellow, grey, purple and green. The formation is vast galleries or amphitheatres, broken by the nature of the rock into rectangular shelves, on which perch myriads of birds, which are as the sands of the sea for multitude. Some of these birds migrate from Norway, lay one egg, and when the young are able they return home, only to come back again each succeeding summer. There are many varieties of them, in part consisting of guillemots, sheldrakes, cormorants, the shag, the gannet, the stormy petrel, the speckled diver, and the sea parrot. One variety will fly with great ease under a boat when pursuing fish than it can in the air, and in the clear water they may be seen at great depths using their wings in this way. They have seen but few men, and do not rise when approached. Their crawling and cries are fearful and awe-inspiring, owing to the vast numbers of birds that are always in the air or on the rocks. 
the whole panorama as seen from the boat is something the beholder will remember as long as he lives we also saw many seals close to the boat these live on the salmon mr stewart used to pay a crown for each of their scalps but since retiring he has withdrawn the bonus and they are now increasing in numbers the sea is very lumpy at the head owing to the squalls that blow down over the cliffs we encountered half a dozen and any one of them would have put a sailboat out of commission in a few minutes they kept a great ground swell in constant motion and the boat rose and fell on the waves like a cork in a whirlpool when rowing home we passed a salmon net at the jutting point with one end of its rope fastened to the rocks we asked why had such a place been selected when there were so many other easier to get at and the man replied salmon are queer fish they have a path round the headlands when going to the spawning grounds and never leave it if that net were moved only fifty yards it would never catch a salmon two men were perched on a small ledge close to the water watching the net against seals as the latter will tear the fish out of the nets with the ferocity of a tiger these men had six hundred feet of sheer rock above them and we asked how they ever got down or up again oh they're used to it they'd been at it since they were boys and they can scale the rocks like monkeys we again slept at the steward arms and we felt so much impressed by what we had seen from the sea that we were determined to go on the head itself and view the surroundings so next morning we started on the car and were soon driving over the long stone bridge with its many arches on the way over the bridge we passed hornhead house the residence of c f stewart a property that has been in the possession of the present family since a stewart raised men to fight for king james against the o'neills in the irish wars the road winds up between vast sand hills the sand being a remarkable orange colour fading into pink in the distance while large tufts of rich deep green bent grass are dotted over its surface making such an unusually striking contrast that we stopped the car for full five minutes to admire it these hills are alive with rabbits they scampered off in all directions at our approach and quickly disappeared into their holes one mile to the west in a direct line is mcsweeney's gun concerning which marvellous fables are told the coast here is very precipitous and perforated with caverns one of which running in for some distance is connected with the surface above by a narrow orifice which is very difficult to find without a guide or very specific directions and the close observance of landmarks through this in rough water the sea dashes throwing up a column of water accompanied by a loud explosion or boom which is said to have been heard as far as Derry. to the south of the rocks lies the fine stretch of tremor strand a little to the northeast of this spot is a circular castle continuing by the shore polygill bay is reached joined by cable with tory island as seen from the land the coast is rocky broken and indented and in about two miles rises into the precipitous mass of horn head over six hundred feet high this headland somewhat resembles in shape a double horn bordered on one side by the inlet of Sheephaven, though on the other the coast trends away to the south. The cliffs present a magnificent spectacle of precipitous descents, shelving, masses of rocks and yawning caverns lashed by the furious waves of the Atlantic. The view from the summit of the head is one of boundless ocean, broken only on the northwest by the islands of Inish Beg, Inish Dewey, Inish Boffin, and Tory, and on the northeast by the different headlands of this rugged coast, i.e., Melmore, Rinmore, 
Thanet, Dunath, and Malin Head, while on the east is seen in the distance the little island of Inishtraho. As we drove down from the head, a drizzling rain began to fall, and we were glad to reach the shelter of the hotel and fortify the inner man with a substantial dinner. At this stage in our tour, we were quite undecided as to our route. We did not like to give up on a visit to Glen Bay, Garton Lakes, and the Poison Glen, as these are considered the finest things of their kind in Ireland, but finally decided that a detour, which would cost us two days of driving, would be impossible, owing to pressure of time. So after sleeping another night in Dunfanaghy, we pressed on to Falcara, inasmuch, however, as I often visited and fished in these glens and lakes. I may be pardoned for attempting to give the reader a short description of their principal features. Loch Vey lies to the east of the Derry Vey Mountains, occupying the opening to Glen Vey. It is a long, narrow sheet of water on the north side, and running into it, a rocky, almost perpendicular wall rises over 1,200 feet, covering the alpine vegetation. Over the top of this wall, several large streams fall and break into cascades as they find their way to the lake below. Back of this, and framing the whole, rises the majestic Dulish, the highest ridge in the Derry Vey range, standing 2,147 feet above the tide. In old times I have counted a dozen eagles that build their nests on the topmost crags overhanging the water, their majestic circling flights giving life and interest to the scene. The south side is a steep hill on which grows in riotous profusion the wild rose, bracken, creeping plants, ferns, lichens, moss, the primrose, the bluebell, the yellow gorse and hazel while in trees it abounds in the grey birch, mountain ash, larch, yew, juniper, white hawthorn, and laburnums with their glorious rain of gold, a mass of teeming harmonies and contrasts. But by far the finest display is its panoply of purple heather, which in some places reaches a height of ten feet. Nowhere else can such heather be found. This is the beauty spot of Ireland. The lower part of the lake equals the best bit of Killarney, while the upper reaches of the glen surpasses it in grandeur. It is indeed the widest mountain pass in Ireland. It may be described as one might say a salad of scenic loveliness made up of countless varieties of colour, form and garniture, for I could pick out parts of it that resemble spots I have seen at the base of the Himalayan mountains in India, and others where I have noticed a similarity to some places I visited near the hot springs of Hakote in Japan. A comparison with the Trossachs of Scotland will result in no reflection on Glen Bay. In fact, there is a close resemblance between them, and I cannot do better than quote Sir Walter Scott's celebrated description in The Lady of the Lake. Sir Walter, the greatest word painter of them all, the wizard of the pen, the man who could pick the magic word and almost paint a scene with it. The western waves of ebbing day rolled o'er the glen their level way. Each purple peak, each flinty spire, was bathed in floods of living fire. But not a setting beam could glow within the dark ravines below, where twined the path in shadow hid round many a rocky pyramid. Shooting abruptly from the dell, its thunder-splintered pinnacle, round many an insulated mass, the native bulwarks of the past. The rocky summits, split and rent, formed turret dome or battlement, or seemed fantastically set with cupola or minaret. Wild crests as pagod ever decked, or mosque of eastern architect, nor were these earth-born castles bare, nor lacked they many a banner fair. For from their shivered brows displayed, far o'er the unfathomable blade, 
all twinkling with the dewdrop sheen the briar rose fell in streamers green and creeping shrubs of thousand dyes waved in the west wind's summer sighs boon nature scattered free and wild each plant or flower the mountain's child here eglantine embalmed the air hawthorn and hazel mingled there the primrose pale and violet flower found in each clift a narrow bower foxglove and nightshade side by side emblems of punishment and pride grouped their dark hues with every stain the weather-beaten crags retain with boughs that quaked at every breath grey birch and aspen wept beneath aloft the ash and wide of oak cast anchor in the rifted rock and higher yet the pine tree hung his shattered trunk and frequent flung where seemed the cliffs to meet on high his boughs athwart the narrow sky highest of all where white peaks glanced where glistening streamers waved and danced the wanderer's eye could barely view the summer heaven's delicious blue so wondrous wild the whole might seem the scenery of a fairy dream the poisoned glen lies to the southwest and is a startling contrast to glen bay it has no vegetation of any kind and is a weird savage cannon ending in a cul-de-sac it looks uncanny and forbidding and seems as though it might be possessed giving the visitor a creepy feeling as he drives through its gloomy defiles no animal or bird is ever seen within its confines as its barn sides will not support life of any form garden lock is seen a few miles to the south it is celebrated for its fine views and its fishing and as the birthplace of saint columba who was born just where a ruined chapel now stands and which was originally erected it is said to mark the spot st patrick made a pilgrimage to this place in 450 a d twenty three thousand acres covering loch and glen Vey and the garton lakes were originally owned by the marshall brothers one of whom john was brother-in-law to the writer owing to the agricultural depression of the times the marshalls could not collect their rents and rather than evict their tenants they sold the estate to mr j g adair mr adair had visited the place and become so enthusiastic about it that he not only bought it but built a splendid castle near the lake and constructed an imposing avenue eight miles long of which he was very proud soon afterwards he stood for a seat in parliament as a tenant right candidate notwithstanding his politics he had troubles with the tenancy his manager and one of the shepherds being killed in one of the numerous affrays that occurred on the property conditions went from bad to worse till at length mr adair decided to clear his estate of tenancy by evicting them upon this such strenuous resistance and threats were made that the matter attracted public attention and became a source of anxiety to the british government so troops were sent down with tents and military equipments and after a time a general eviction took place the tenants had no means of support and national sympathy went out to them finally the government of victoria offered to take all of them out to australia free of charge and as most of them accepted the offer this closed the unfortunate incident personally mr adair was a gracious and upright man but he contended as a matter of principle that he owned the land and could do as he liked with it this was precisely the same ground that mr morgan took when being examined in new york recently on the witness stand with regard to his connection with american trusts since mr adair's death his wife had resided in the castle a part of each year and had recently entertained some eminent personages there as the following item from the londonderry sentinel of september the thirteenth will show lord kitchener and the distinguished party 
informing the guests of Mrs. Adair at Glenvay Castle have enjoyed an excellent week's sport. Several fine stags have been killed in the deer forest. There was a very successful rabbit shoot at Garton on Wednesday. On Thursday, Lord Brassey's famous yacht Sunbeam, which had been at London Derry since Monday, left for Loxwilly, and yesterday the house party embarked for a cruise round Horn Head. The house party consisted of the following Lord Kitchener, Lord and Lady Brassey, the Duchess of St. Albans, the Lady Alice Beauclerc, Sir Donald Mackenzie Wallace, the official historian of the voyage of the Ophir, Lady Delisle, Captain Arthur Campbell, Captain Butler, and the Duke and Duchess of Connacht. The departing guests were conveyed to the Sunbeam and to the railway station in Mrs. Adair's powerful motor car. End of Dunfanaghy to Falcara Five of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Falcara to Gidor. We are now on the road to Falcara, seven miles distant, and we pass His Majesty's Mail, northbound from Letterkenny. A crimson car loaded with mail bags and luggage, and a driver wearing a bright yellow sou'wester. Everything was drenched, and the horse in a steaming lather. Truly a novel sight for a Denzian of Broadway. Falcara is the place from which you take a boat to visit Tory Island, some eight miles out in the Atlantic. It has been called the Sentinel of the Atlantic, and it is well named, being the first land one sees when nearing Ireland. Its name means the Island of the Towers, and it looked from the deck of the Columbia as though it had been built up by some titanic race of old. It did not seem to us that it could be of much value, but it was considered important enough to fight for in the early days when giants were in the land. The Book of Ballymote states that it was possessed by the Fomorians, a race of pirates and giants who inhabited Ireland twelve centuries before the Christian era. Their chief was Belar of the Mighty Blows, and two of the rocks on the east coast of the island are called Baylor's Castle and Baylor's Prison. One of their number, named Conang, erected a tower on the island, as recorded in the Book of Lacan. The tower of the island, the island of the tower, the citadel of Conang, the son of Phobar. It contains a portion of a round tower, built of undressed boulders of red granite. It was never more than about 40 feet in height, is 17 feet 2 inches in diameter, and the walls at the base are 4 feet 3 inches thick. The doorway is 5 and a half feet high and is 8 feet from the ground. There are also ruins of two churches, a monastery having been founded here by St. Columba, and a peculiar Tau cross. On the northwest end of the island is a fine lighthouse illuminated by gas, and it has also a fog siren and a group flashing light. It stands a hundred and thirty feet above high water. Near it is the new signal station of Lloyd's, which is in telegraphic communication with Dunfanaghy. There are a chapel, schoolhouse, and post office also on the island. The rock scenery of the northeast coast is very fine and characteristic. The southwest coast is low and flat and fringed with treacherous rocks. It was here that the gunboat Wasp was wrecked on the 22nd of September 1884, and all its crew except six drowned. Fishing is the chief industry, 
and the islanders are good fishermen pursuing their avocation now chiefly in norway yawls instead of curraghs the congested districts board have aided the inhabitants by supplying these vessels the cost to be repaid by small instalments also in building a curing station and teaching the people how to cure fish quantities of lobsters and crabs are caught and a sligo steamer calls once a week for the fish there is a lack of fuel which has to be supplied from the mainland the inhabitants have paid no rents since the loss of the wasp which was sent to enforce payment or evict the tenants st columba the patron saint of the place is reported to have landed here in a curragh from falcara you get a fine view of muckish with its twenty two hundred feet of altitude while not the highest mountain in the donegal highlands muckish is longer and of greater bulk than any of its rivals and is also more imposing its name in irish means a pig's back which it very much resembles here in ballyconnell house the seat of vibrance olfert esq where the plan of campaign was originated so well known in connection with the landlord and tenant troubles in ireland we now took the shore road through a district known as Clohaneely, where English is rarely spoken, and we had to make our way by signs, spending a few minutes en route at a national school and hearing them teach the children both Irish and English. Continuing, we passed close to Bloody Foreland, a head 1,050 feet high, so called because of its ruddy colour. Arriving at Bunbeg, we stopped to feed the horse and take some lunch ourselves and then made play for the Gidor Hotel. Our road took us past the spot where Inspector Martin was clubbed to death when executing a warrant for the arrest of the Reverend James McFadden P.P. in February 1899, in connection with the Gidor evictions. End of Falcara to Gidor Chapter 6 of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Gidor to Glenties. The Gidor is a famous inn built over fifty years ago by Lord George Hill on the River Claddy. It has held its supremacy as a centre for salmon fishing and grouse shooting for half a century. The guests supplied the table so bountifully with fish in the early days that the writer has recollections, as a boy, of thinking that scales were growing on his back after having been at the hotel for a week. Many celebrities have fished and shot there. Thackeray, Dickens, Lord Palmerston, Caroline and a host of others have had their feet under its mahogany and have looked out its windows at Erigo, popularly known as the Peerless Cone, the base of which is not over a mile distant. This mountain rises to a height of 2,466 feet, scarred and naked to its peak. Sleeve Schnacht, 2,240 feet, is another fine peak near it. The name of Lord George Hill, the late proprietor of the estate, is so thoroughly identified with that of Gidor that it will not be amiss to retail a few facts concerning him. He first settled in this part of the country in 1838, purchasing 23,000 acres in the parish of Tullybegley, which he found in a state of distress and want so great that it became the subject of a parliamentary inquiry. Although there appears to have been a considerable amount of exaggeration in the statements made, enough remains to show that famine, pestilence, and ignorance were lamentably prevalent. The prospects of the landlord were far from encouraging. 
on account of the stony nature of the ground, the severity of the climate, and the difficulty of collecting his rent. But more than all, the extraordinary tough, miserable system of Rundale, which was universal throughout the district. By this arrangement, a parcel of land was divided and subdivided into an incredibly small number of holdings, in which the tenant very likely held his portion or share in thirty or forty different places, which had no fences or walls whatever to mark them. The utter confusion and hopelessness of each tenant's being able to know his own land, much less to plant or look after it, may well be imagined. And not only to the land was this system applied, but also to portable property. With much perseverance and many struggles, Lord George Hill gradually changed the face of things. He overcame and altered the Rundale system, improving the land, built schools, a church, and a local store at Bunbeg, made roads, established a post office, and, what is perhaps most important to the traveller, a hotel. He took a direct and personal interest in the good management of the hotel, and in the comfort of the guests who patronized it, frequently stopping at the house himself, dining, and spending the evening with them. Since his death in 1879, the hotel has kept up its traditional reputation for comfort and general good management. Carlyle visited Lord Hill at Gidor in 1849, and this is the way in which he described his host afterwards. A handsome, grave smiling man of fifty or more, thick grizzled hair, elegant nose, low cooing voice, military composure, and absence of loquacity, a man you love at first sight. This was indeed high praise for a man of Carlyle's cantankerous temper. Lord Hill was so popular with his tenantry that when his horse broke down they would take the animal out of the shafts fasten ropes to the car, and pull it home triumphantly, with the owner seated in state, no matter how many miles they had to cover. He was a most courteous and obliging man. I well remember how, in the early sixties, he walked a considerable distance and took particular pains to show me the best fishing spots on the river. They tell a joke at the hotel on an English dude, who asked Pat the Gilly, Oh, my good man! Do you mind telling me a oh, sort of fish you catch here? Well, to tell you the truth, was Pat's quick reply, you never can tell till you pulls them out. There was a big fishing crowd there, and when I announced at dinner that it was more than forty years since I had sat at the table and fished in the river, they all doffed their caps to me, metaphorically, and gave me more salmon and other good things that I could eat or drink. We hadn't time to fish, and so we pushed on the next day through the Ross's district, with its innumerable freshwater lakes and saltwater inlets. So intermingled were they, that it was hard to decide which was which, and we finally got to know that where rack grew on the shore, the water was salt and connected somewhere with the sea. We stopped at Dunlow for lunch, then descended into the Gibara River Valley, and crossed the large new steel bridge of that name, erected by the Congested Districts Board to give the people employment on that and the roads connected with it at both ends. The way lies through an unimaginably wild country, by which such constant and shifting panorama of mountain scenery that the attention is never fatigued. You see in review the Dunluwe Mountains, Schliefschnacht, Errigal, Duish, and the Derry Bay chains. In fact, if the weather is fine, and it all depends on that, there is scarcely such another mountain view in the kingdom. The head of Gibara Bay, where the river joins it, is a queer-looking place. We skirted its shores for miles and enjoyed its peculiarities. When the tide is out, the water is of a seal-brown colour, due to the peat. When it is in, the colour is bright green. Where the tides meet is a mixture of both colours, and frequently some of the shallows side by side 
will be of either brown or green, making a checkered appearance. While all this is going on, waterfalls from the hillsides pour their brown waters into the bay, and very often into pools of green. This phenomenon, in connection with the pleasing picture formed by the numerous small islands which dot the surrounding waters, make it well worth while to wait and witness the tide in its changing stages. We finished our twenty-five mile drive in an hour or so, and put up for the night at O'Donnell's Glenties. End of Gidor to Glenties. Chapter Seven of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Glenties to Carrick. In some Irish hotels, they set apart a room for the drummers to write and eat in at lower prices than the public tariff, and this is as sacred ground as a Hindu temple. For an ordinary personage to desecrate it by his presence is simply an unpardonable crime, and is resented by the drummers accordingly. The doors are not always marked, and so it happened that I innocently wandered into this reserved room in the O'Donnell Hotel at Plenty's, and began to write a letter. I had hardly got as far as Dear Sir when the intrusion was noticed, and promptly reported to the proprietor, who came in and apologetically asked me, What line are ye in, sir? To which I promptly responded, Selling Powers Irish Whiskey. He reported my vocation to the committee. All were satisfied, and I was allowed to finish my letter. Afterwards, Mr. O'Donnell came to me and said, with a wink, It's all right, Mr. Bain. Your bluff went down with the boys, but tis my private opinion that you're buying more whiskey than you're selling. Next morning, when the sun rose, we set off for Carrick, a scenery and ruined centre, the forts, etc., dating back to the 6th century. This was a favourite resort of Sir Frederick Lytton, the artist, who frequently spent his summers there. We took a noon rest at Ardara, and then pushed on to complete our twenty-eight miles. Before reaching Carrick, we traversed the Glenish Pass, a deep and beautiful ravine, with verdure clad, the hills on both sides rising one thousand six hundred and fifty feet above sea level, their slopes ornamented with many waterfalls, all joining to make up a brawling stream which rushed headlong down the valley. Altogether, the place was a charming one. The pass was four miles long, and poor Bob could not make it with the load, so we got off and climbed the road on foot, while he fed and followed us with the empty car up the steep incline. We nursed him into Carrick, but he had to have a rest, and after getting it his owner drove him home, and we parted with John, our worthy Jehu, and his good nag Bob, both of whom had helped us well along on our pilgrimage. As we were approaching Glenesh, we met a young Donegal girl on the road. She was dressed in black serge, and although her feet were bare, her figure was erect and her carriage was graceful. She swung along the road with charming abandon, and might have shone at a drawing-room in Dublin Castle, the embodiment, the quintessence of unconscious grace. End of Glenties to Car Chapter 8 of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Carrick to Donegal. We put up at the Glen Columkill Hotel in Carrick. Here we hired a new car with a stout white horse to draw it, which took us to the base of Bunglass Head and waited for our return. 
It is a hard climb of over three miles to reach the summit, over rocks, bog and heather, but we were well rewarded for our trouble. Bunglass fills the role of a grandstand, as it were, from which you get a good view of Schlieve League Mountain, whose base rises abruptly out of the sea, which breaks against it with great violence. We had heard that the Golden Eagle builds its nests on this headland, but we did not succeed in finding any of the birds, and concluded that they had flown over to see King Edward's coronation. A view of singular magnificence here bursts upon you, a view that of its kind is probably unequalled in the British Isles. The lofty mountain of Schlieve League gives on the land side no promise of the magnificence that it presents from the sea, being in fact a mural precipice of 1,972 feet in height, descending to the water's edge in one superb escarpment, around whose caverned base the whirlpools and the waves, bursting and eddying irresistibly, rage and resound for ever. And not only in its height is it so sublime, but in the glorious colours which are grouped in masses on its face, stains of metals green, amber, gold, yellow, white, red, and every variety of shade are observable, particularly when seen under a bright sun, contrasting in a wonderful manner with the dark blue waters beneath. In cloudy or stormy weather, this peculiarity is to a certain degree lost, though other effects take its place and render it even more magnificent. This range of sea cliffs extends with little variation all the way to Malin, though at nothing like the same altitude. Having feasted our eyes on the beauties of the precipices, we then ascended, skirting the cliffs the whole way. Near the summit, the escarpment cuts off the land slope so suddenly as to leave only a sharp edge with a fearful precipice of about 1,500 feet on the side towards the sea and a steep slope on the landward side. The ledge is termed One Man's Path and is looked on by the inhabitants of the neighbourhood in the same light as the striding edge of Helvellyn or the Pulkemine of Snowdon. There is a narrow track or ledge on the land slope a little below this edge facetiously called the old man's path by the guides at the very summit are the remains of the ancient oratory of saint hugh macbrecon the view is wonderfully fine southward is the whole coast of sligo and mayo from ben bulben to the stags of broadhaven while farther in the distance are faintly seen Neffen near Ballina and Crowpatrick Mountain at Westport. Northward is a perfect sea of Donegal Mountains reaching as far as Slievesnacht and Errigo, and all the intervening ranges near Ardara, Glentis and Dunlow. Coming down was almost as bad as going up had been, but we finally reached our car and were driven home for a late dinner. On the way we were shown the place where Prince Charlie, the pretender, embarked when he fled from the English forces. End of Carrick to Donegal Nine of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon Donegal to Ballyshannon. Next morning, in a blinding rain, we got up behind a stout black horse driven by Charlie, a conversational soloist of unrivalled garrulity, who, under these conditions, told us entirely too much about Finn McCool's and Red Hugh's feats and what they did to their neighbours. We passed through Killybegs, but our destination was Donegal Town and after we reached it, we discharged Charlie, took dinner, and aired ourselves around the city, taking what baseball players call a stretch. The principal objects of interest here are the ruined abbey 
and the castle of the O'Donnells. The monastery was founded for Franciscan friars in 1474 by Hugh Roe O'Donnell and his wife Fignola, daughter of Conor O'Brien of Thomond, and in it they were both buried. His son, Hugh Og, finally took the habit of St. Francis and was buried here in 1537. Red Hugh O'Donnell, having taken up arms against the English, his brother-in-law, Niall Garov, sided with them and took possession of the monastery. It was besieged by O'Donnell, and during the siege some barrels of gunpowder, which had been stored, took fire, and the explosion destroyed the building. Red Hugh, after the fiasco of the Spanish landing at Kinsale, to which he went, sailed to Spain to further assist, and died there at the early age of twenty-eight, being buried in Valladolid. Niall Garov, having lost the confidence of the English, was imprisoned in the Tower of London, and died after eighteen years of captivity. The O'Donnells, or Kinnell Connell, were descended from Niall of the Nine Hostages, who became King of Ireland in 379 AD. Of his sons, Owen, or Owen, was ancestor of the O'Neills, and Conal Gubon of the O'Donnells. The country of the former was called Tyr Owen, or Tyrone, or Owen's territory, and extended over the eastern part of Donegal, and the counties of Tyrone and Londonderry. The peninsula of Inishon also received its name from him. Tyr Connell, the territory of Connell, extended over County Donegal. Between these races, bound together as they were by common descent and frequent intermarriages, wars were of constant occurrence through many generations. The Cahat of the O'Donnells is a crumdach or box, made, as its inscription says, by Cahar O'Doherty towards the end of the 11th century. It contains a portion of the Psalms in Latin said to have been written by St. Columba, and which led to the Battle of Drumcliff and his subsequent exile to Iona. It was carried by a priest three times in front of the troops of the O'Donnells before a contest, hence its name, the Battler. The silver case enclosing the box was made by Colonel O'Donnell in 1723. It was presented by the late Sir Richard O'Donnell to the Royal Irish Academy, where it now is. Either in the monastery or in some building near it were compiled between 1632 and 1636 the famous Annals of Donegal, better known under the title of the Annals of the Four Masters, Michael and Cochori O'Cleary, Barfasa o Mulcori, and Cochori O'Dignan. The object of this compilation was to detail the history of Ireland up to the time in which they lived including all local events such as the foundation and destruction of churches and castles the deaths of remarkable persons the inauguration of kings the battles of chiefs the contests of clans etc a book consisting of eleven hundred quarto pages beginning with the year twenty two forty two b c and ending with the year sixteen sixteen a d thus covering the immense space of nearly four thousand years of a nation's history must be dry and meagre of details in some if not in all parts of it and although the learned compilers had at their disposal or within their reach an immense mass of historic details still the circumstances under which they wrote were so unfavourable that they appeared to have exercised a sound discretion and one consisting with the economy of the time and of their resources when they left the details of the very early history of Ireland in the safe keeping of such ancient original records as had from remote ages preserved them, and collected as much as they could make room for of the events of more modern times, particularly those eventful days in which they themselves lived. This interesting record, which was originally written in native Irish, has in later times been translated by Mr. Eugene O'Curry who has given to the world of general literature a very able translation of this monumental work. End of Donegal to Ballyshannon
Chapter 10 of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Ballyshannon to Sligo. With a fresh horse, we started for Ballyshannon, some fifteen miles ahead of us. The surrounding country was interesting and appeared to be prosperous containing many fine seats, the great feature of which was their magnificent timber. Ballyshannon seems a busy town, with 2,500 inhabitants. Its castle, of which scarcely any traces remain, belongs to the O'Donnells, and was the scene of a disastrous defeat of the English under Sir Converse Clifford in 1597. The castle was besieged with vigour for three days, and an attempt made to sap the walls. But the garrison, having made a desperate sally, the English retreated in haste, and, pursued by Hugh Roe O'Donnell, they lost a great portion of their force in an unsuccessful attempt to cross the Urn. The two portions of the town, the lower one of which is called the Port, are connected by a bridge of twelve arches, about four hundred yards above the celebrated falls, where an enormous body of water is precipitated over a cliff some thirty feet high and ten feet above high water, with a noise that is perfectly deafening. This is the scene of the salmon leap. The salmon that come down the river in the autumn return again in the spring months and this can only be accomplished by ascending the falls. Traps with funnel-shaped entrances are placed in different parts of the falls, in which the salmon are caught, and taken out for market as required. Between the traps are intervals through which the fish can reach the top of the falls by leaping, and, as at low water, the spring is about sixteen feet, the scene is singularly interesting. Below the falls is the island of Inish Samer, on which are buildings connected to the fishery. The fishery is very valuable and is owned by Messrs. Moore and Alexander. On the bridge is a tablet to William Allingham, 1824-1889, a native of Ballyshannon. I give Allingham's own description of his home. It can hardly be surpassed in the English language for simple, graceful, and yet direct diction. I also quote a few lines from a poem he wrote before he sailed for America. They are not Miltonian in their style, but Milton could not have touched the spot as he did. The little old town where I was born has a voice of its own, low, solemn, persistent humming through the air day and night, summer and winter. Whenever I think of the town, I seem to hear the voice, the river which makes its rolls over the rocky ledges into the tide. Before spreads a great ocean in sunshine or storm. Behind stretches a many-islanded lake. On the south runs a wavy line of blue mountains, and on the north, over green rocky hills, rise peaks of a more distant range. The trees hide in glens, or cluster near the river. Grey rocks and boulders lie scattered about the windy pastures. The sky arches wide over all, giving room to multitudes of stars by night, and long processions of clouds blown from the sea. But also, in the childish memory where these pictures live, to deeps of celestial blue in the endless days of summer. An odd, out-of-the-way little town, ours, on the extreme western verge of Europe. Our next neighbours, sunset away, being citizens of the great new republic, which, indeed, to our imagination, seems little, if at all, farther off than England, in the opposite direction. Adieu to Ballyshannon, where I was bred and born. Go where I may, I think of you, as sure as night and morn. The kindly spot, the friendly town, where every one is known, and not a face in all the place, but partly seems my own. 
There's not a house or window, there's not a field or hill. But east or west, in foreign lands, I recollect them still. I leave my warm heart with you, though my back I'm forced to turn. So adieu, Valley Shannon, and the winding banks of Ern. Farewell, Coolmore Bundoran, and your summer crowds that run from island homes to see with joy the atlantic setting sun to breed the buoyant salted air and sport among the waves to gather shells on the sandy beach and tempt the gloomy caves to watch the flowing ebbing tide the boats the crabs the fish young men and maids to meet and smile from a tender wish the sick and old in search of health for all things have their turn and i must quit my native shore and the winding banks of urn near here are the ruins of kilbaron castle an ancient fortress of the o'clearies a family renowned in their day for their skills in science poetry and history of whom was father michael o'cleary the leader of the illustrious quartet of the four masters it stands on a precipitous rock at the very edge of the coast in the vicinity of ballyshannon can be seen ballymacward castle which was built during the famine in seventeen thirty nine this was the home of the colleen bon famous in song and story who was one of the Folliot girls and eloped with Willie Riley. Now we are on the road to Bundorn, and we had hardly cleared the skirts of Ballyshannon, but it began to rain so hard that even had old Noah been with us, he could not have bragged much about the flood. It came in at our collars and went out at our boots. Our new driver could not be induced to say a single word except yes or no. He was neither a historian a botanist nor a geologist and he took no interest whatever in ruins but we forgave him for all these shortcomings for he drove his horse steadily onward through the torrent with an unswerving perseverance that covered a multitude of his sins when we arrived at bundorn's fashionable watering-place hotel the irish highlands the guests received us with shouts of laughter in which we good-humouredly joined no more weary pilgrims ever drew rein at inn in such a sorry plight our clothes were dried during the night and with a new steed we started for sligo it was clear weather and we had a pleasant ride along the coastline the feature of the day was skirting the base of ben bulban for about seven miles this is a most peculiar mountain almost 1800 feet high its base starts in with patches of yellow and sage green verdure then turns to streams of broken rocks from these regular pillars of stone start like the pipes of an organ which can be seen for 50 miles these again being covered by a flat crown of green growth the whole looks like a vast temple in india a large waterfall consisting of three separate cascades cuts its side and adds greatly to its beauty and attractiveness we passed through the village of drumcliff situated on the bank of the river of the same name which here enters drumcliff bay from glencar lake a monastery was founded here by saint columba the site for which was given in 575, and it was made into a bishop's see afterwards, united to Elfin. This village was anciently called Drumcliff of the Crosses, and of the remains of these, the Great Cross is a fine example. It is 13 feet high and 3 feet 8 inches across the arms, which are connected by the usual circular segments. It is a hard sandstone and consists of three sections the base shaft and top 
It is highly sculpted, showing human figures, animals, and fine interlaced scroll work. There is also the stump of a round tower, about forty feet high, of rude masonry of the earliest group. The door is square-headed, six feet from the ground, and the walls are three feet thick. Near Drumcliff was fought a great battle in 561, arising out of a quarrel over the possession of a copy of a Latin Psalter made by St. Columba from one borrowed from St. Finian of Mouville. St. Finian claimed the copy, and the case was brought before Dermot, King of Meath, who decided, Brehan fashion, that as to every cow belongs its calf, so to every book belongs its copy, a judgment for which St. Columba appealed to his tribe. The party of St. Columba was victorious, three thousand of the men of Meath being slain. St. Columba was advised by St. Moles to go to Scotland and convert the pagans as penance for the blood he had shed, which he did and founded a monastery establishment in Iona. Lord Palmerston took a great interest in this part of the country, laying out plantations in 1842 and building a harbour, which we saw from the car. It cost him over £20,000. Whilst riding along, we noticed the tower on a distant hill, and said to the driver, Is that a round tower? Yes, sir. Are you sure it's a round tower? Yes, sir, I am. It's square, it is. End of Ballyshannon to Sligo Chapter 11 of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon Sligo to Ballinrobe We finally reached Sligo, and Sligo is quite a place, both historically and commercially. It has a population of 10,274, and is an important seaport town in close neighbourhood to scenery such as falls to the lot of very few business towns. It is remarkably well situated, in the centre of a richly wooded plain, encircled on all sides save that of the sea by high mountains, the ascent of which commences within three to four miles of the town, while on one side of it is Loch Gill, almost equal in beauty to any lake in Ireland, and on the other a wide and sheltered bay. Connection between the two is maintained by the broad river Garavogue, which issues from Loch Gill and empties itself after a course of nearly three miles into Sligo Bay. It is crossed by two bridges joining the parish of St. John with that of Calry on the north bank. Steamers ply regularly between this town and Glasgow and Liverpool. Sligo attained some importance as early as 1245 as the residence of Maurice Fitzgerald, Earl of Kildare, who there founded a castle and monastery. The castle played an important part in the struggles of the English against the Irish chiefs in the 13th century, and subsequently in which the rivals O'Connors and O'Donnells were mainly concerned. Sligo suffered in the massacres of 1641, when it was taken by Sir Frederick Hamilton, and the abbey was burned. The parliamentary troops, under Sir Charles Coote, took it in 1645, after a battle in which the Irish were defeated and the warlike Archbishop of Tuam, Malachy O'Kelly, was killed. In the great abbey, which is now a fine ruin, is a grave of Pat Biolan, who did not give in, as they say in Ireland, till he had reached the age of 144. While at Sligo we met the brother of Lieutenant Hen, owner of the Galathia, and who tried to lift the cup with her some years ago. This man is a local judge, 
and a very pleasant and entertaining gentleman, reminding us greatly of his brother, whose estate he inherited. End of Sligo to Ballon Robe. Twelve of On an Irish Chaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Ballon Robe to Linan. Our next points were Clare Morris and Ballon Robe. They were not interesting, so we took a car to Cong, a very ancient place lying on the neck of land which separates Loch Corrib from Loch Mask. St. Fakin of Four founded a church here in 624, and it is at this place that Lord Ardalon has his castle, a large building on the shores of Loch Corrib, surrounded by an immense park with fine timber, Italian sunken gardens, and a pheasantry. In the gardens, in luxuriant profusion, Countless varieties of rare plants, gigantic palms, delicate ferns, are as much at home as in their native tropics, carefully nurtured in a climate tempered to their necessities, soft and balmy from the influence of the Gulf Stream. Lord Ardalon has many other attractions besides these at Ashford Castle. They are steam yachts, watch towers, conservatories, stables, a salmon river, game preserves, and a large herd of red and fallow deer, not to mention the Augustinian monastery built by the king monk Roderick O'Connor in the twelfth century. He was the last Irish king and lived the concluding fifteen years of his life within these walls as a monk in the strictest seclusion. He died in 1198, aged 82. The Cross of Kong which was made for Tuam, was brought here, it is thought, by Roderick O'Connor. It measures two and a half feet high, one foot six and three quarter inches across arms, and one and three quarter inches thick. It is made of oak, plated with copper, covered with the most beautiful gold tracery of Celtic pattern. In the centre of the arms is a large crystal. Thirteen of the original eighteen jewels remain set along the edges of the shaft and arms, while eleven of those which were set down the centre of the arms and shaft and around the crystal are lost. It was found by the Reverend P. Prendergast early in the present century in a chest in the village, and after his death it was purchased by Professor McCulloch for one hundred guineas and presented to the Royal Irish Academy. Locks, Mask and Corrib are connected by an underground river, as the porous nature of the rock will not permit the water to flow on the surface. We went down thirty feet into the pigeon hole, which is near the castle, to see the flow of water through the ground. The arrangements for seeing this place might truly be called hospitality in a high form, as everything is shown and nothing is expected in return for the courtesy. The solicitude of the old gatekeeper for our welfare was particularly marked for when we returned to the gate after a very peaceful inspection he doffed his hat and exclaimed glory be to god your honours have returned safe and in good health too i see during the irish famine an attempt was made to dig a canal connecting the lakes so as to give the people something to do and an enormous amount of money was sunk in the project the rocky bed absorbed the water, however, as fast as it flowed in, and the enterprise proved an utter failure. Every visitor asks what it is when he sees it. It is called the Great Blunder. End of Ballon Robe to Linan. Chapter 13 of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Linan to Recess. Next morning, with new car, horse, and driver, we put off for Linan, twenty seven miles away. 
We drove along the banks of Loch Mask, with its groups of small wooded islands, and left it to take the road along Loch Nafui, a very picturesque drive. After some hours of driving, we put up at McKeown's Hotel in Linan. Mac is a Puba, a tall, strapping young Irishman, a six-foot tour with an intermittent laugh that takes most of the sting out of his hotel bills, and he holds the complimentary title of Major. He runs an up-to-date hotel, is postmaster, owns a store, has all the mail posting contracts, rents salmon and trout rivers and lakes, ships salmon to London, and owns 10,000 acres of shooting land stocked with grouse, hare, snipe, duck, and cock, which he lets to visitors, as well as seal shooting on the bay. He also owns a sheep mountain, from which he serves mutton to his guests, in all the ways that mankind has ever known since sheep were first slaughtered for food. We had on succeeding days as part of the menu roast mutton, hot and cold, stewed lamb, boiled leg, roast saddle, minced lamb, mutton cutlass, broiled kidneys, lamb chops, Irish stew, suet pudding, sweetbreads, French chops, sheep's head, and mutton broth. We fancied we could detect wool growing on the palms of our hands when we left the hotel, and could have forgiven Mac if we could only have found it starting on the tops of our heads instead. At another hotel in the fishing centre we had an aquarium-style living, which in time became monotonous. They served up in the course of time for our delectation salmon boiled and salmon broiled, cold salmon, salmon steak, salmon croquettes, salmon cutlets, and stewed salmon, intersected with white trout, black trout, yellow trout, brown trout, sea trout, speckled trout, and gillaroo. But at recess they combined such things with chops, duck, green peas, lobster, and Irish sole right out of the nearby sea. All hail recess, and long life to Polly, the peach-cheeked waitress who served us so nimbly. Next morning, we crossed Killery Bay in a boat, and while doing so we noticed that the captain held his leg in a kind of constrained position. We asked him if it was stiff or if he was troubled with rheumatism. No, to tell your honour the truth, there's a hole in the boat, and I'm just keeping me heel in it to save her from sinking. After landing, we drove to Delphi to see its lake and woods, then on to Loch Dew, a long sheet of water from the banks of which the mountains rise to a height of 2,500 feet. Delphi is one of the loveliest spots in Connemara, but we can hardly go as far as the enthusiastic Englishman who wrote, It may be safely said that if Connemara contained no other beauty, Delphi alone would be worth the journey from London for the sake of the mountain scenery. Delphi House formerly belonged to the Marquis of Sligo and at one time he lived there. We returned by driving round the head of the bay with a horse that would have retarded a funeral procession. Within a mile of the hotel there is a double echo, which we tested by loud whistling on our fingers. After crossing the bay the echo came back to us with great strength, striking our side of the mountain again and thus making a second echo. On the morning before we left I lay in bed half asleep, and, as the bedrooms in the west of Ireland rarely have any locks on the doors, our confidential boots stole quietly into the room, and looking at me, soliloquized in a tender tone suggestive of a tip, if I should hear him, sure his honour is slapin' like a baby, and twould be nothing short of a crime to wake him up this wet morning. I haven't the heart to do it. And he walked out of the room with his eye on the furniture. The following day we took in the Killeries, as they are called. This is a long arm of the sea, surrounded by high, bold mountains, clothed with very green verdure, 
to their tops. It is a wonderful fjord which has scarcely any parallel in the British Isles and much resembles the coast scenery in Norway. Capacious and fit for the largest ships, it runs inland to the very heart of the mountains for a distance of some nine miles. The mountain scenery on the north of the fjord is incomparably the finest. The enormous walls of Mwilray, the giant of the west, and Ben Gorm rising abruptly to the height of 2,688 feet and 2,303 feet while the excessive stillness of the landlocked water in which the shadows of the hills are clearly reflected makes it difficult for one to believe that it is the actual ocean which he beholds. That night, after a drive of twelve miles, we reached Casson's Hotel in Letterfrack, where we asked for a fire in the dining room, as it was cold when we arrived. The maid brought a burning scuttle of peat, the smoke from which did not subside during the entire dinner, but it looked comfortable to see each other through it, reminding us of cheerful fires and warm nooks at home. The comparison could go no further, however. We asked the maid for a wine list, in order that we might try to overcome the effects of the smoke, and she responded with great naivete that she had no wine list but would bring us a sample from every bin in the cellar. In a few minutes, sure enough, she bounced into the room with her arms full of bottles, saying, Take your choice, gentlemen. There's nothing finer in all Connemara. We took her at her word. She had not deceived us. The bottle we selected was a good claret. Next morning, the landlady furnished us with the best animal we had on the trip, she was a stout bay mare, and when her spirits had rallied, after leaving a young colt of hers behind, she reeled off the miles like a machine. Our object in visiting this part of the country was to see Mitchell Henry's famous castle, Kylemore, and the Twelve Pins, about which we had been hearing all our lives, without ever having had an opportunity to visit them until now. Mr. Henry was a linen merchant with houses in Belfast and Manchester. He made a fortune, purchased 14,000 acres of land in Connemara to give himself a political foothold, and in consequence became MP for Galway, which position he retained for six years. About 40 years ago, he began the construction of Kyle Moore, selecting as a site a valley between very high mountains with a lake and a river in front of the spot where his castle would stand. He collected rare trees and planted the mountain sides with them, as well as the valley around his buildings. In addition to the castle, he erected fine stables, private chapel, sheltered gardens and conservatories, and preserved the salmon and trout in the lake and river. The moist heat from the Gulf Stream was his main ally, and nowhere else in the world can more bursting vigour and splendid growth be seen than are exhibited by his trees, shrubs and flowers. To see them is a veritable treat to those who are interested in such things. In the gardens flourish groups of tropical plants, palms and rare ferns the year round. They need no protection in this mild climate. His roads have double fuchsia hedges twelve feet high, which anywhere else than in Connemara would be worth a fortune. They were in full bloom when we saw them. Mr. Henry is now a very old man and lives in London, and the sad part of it all is that he cannot enjoy the glories of his famous property, and it is for sale. Sic Transit Gloria Mundi After visiting the castle, church, gardens and conservatories, we drove through the extensive, finely wooded domain, passing vast banks of rhododendrons and hydrangeas in rare bloom, till we reached the country road and caught our first glimpse of the twelve pins, or bends, 
as they are sometimes called. They were a disappointment. We had heard too much about them. The Twelve Pins is a group of high mountains having but little verdure. The highest, Ben Bon, is 2,400 feet above sea level. The remarkable feature about them is that they are practically one long mountain with 12 peaks rising from it at regular intervals. Accepting this startling effect, they do not compare with Muckish, Dewish, or Erigo, the peerless cone of Donegal. The bay mare carried us in gallant style past the long romantic-looking Loch Ina, down to recess, where we put up at the best hotel we had found since we started. End of Linan to Recess Chapter 14 of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon Ackle Island I am writing this from memory and without notes, so I may be pardoned for having forgotten to introduce in its proper place our trip to Ackle Island, one of the most interesting of our experiences. I shall start by saying that we crossed over to the island at its nearest point to the mainland, and taking our seats on a long public car, which stood in readiness, we were pulled by two immense horses the thirteen miles to the village of Dugort, at a steady pace that never slackened up for the entire distance. It rained, but the car was plentifully supplied with tarpaulins, which were strapped around us in artistic style. So we arrived at the Schlievemore Hotel dry but benumbed. Mine host of the Schlievemore, one Captain Sheridan, is perhaps the best known Boniface in the west of Ireland. The iridescent splendour of his imagination, his contempt for detail, and his facility in escaping when cornered place him on a plinth so high that compared with him Baron Munchausen would seem to be a practical monument of truth and accuracy. Indeed, the Baron is his only rival in all the years that have gone to make up history. He greeted us with, I saw you coming, knew by your looks you were the real thing, and wired for a ten-pound salmon. We were stiff and cold after the wet drive, and asked for a nip of Irish whisky. Oh, bad luck to it anyway. I haven't a drop in the house, but my team is hauling a cask of powers best from the mainland. But I have scotch, boys. As is scotch, not a headache in a hogshead of it. So we had the substitute, and upon our asking its age, he started in rather modestly at five, and when we gave him a drink, quickly raised it to ten years old. Before the evening was over, he told us, in a confidential whisper, that the Prime Minister had been his guest some time before, and had pronounced it twenty. So he did not know how old it really was. We must be the judges. He had a collection of stuffed birds and horns, and upon being asked what he would take for a pair of ram's horns, he exclaimed, "'Tis simply priceless they are. T'would cost you a thousand pounds to fit out an expedition to get them, and besides, you would have to get permission from the Grand Lama of Tibet, for tis only in his dominions that these rare animals are found. But still, I have too many horns, and I let you have the pair for forty guineas, packed up and ready for the steamer. He admitted that he was a first cousin of Phil Sheridan's. They tried to make out that Phil Sheridan wasn't an Irishman, that he was born halfway over. But I tell you, the true facts are he was born before he started, was the way he conclusively settled General Sheridan's nationality. Guests move on at the approach of rain in Irish hotels, so our genial host would pass from room to room if it threatened rain, calling out to imaginary guests, "'Twill be a lovely day tomorrow." Pressed to divulge his sentiments on the landlord and tenant question, 
and not knowing how we stood, he said, I'm for give and take. The tenant to give what he thinks fair, and the landlord to take it or leave it. He had a supreme contempt for rival attractions, and said that the Dunfanaghy puffins were corn-fed, and the seals were chained to the bottom to attract visitors. He had a comic opera smuggler, weather predictor, and long-distance sea serpent man, who turned up every morning and mingled with the guests. He dressed the part to perfection, a la Dick Deadeye, and would tell you how many whales and seals he had seen in the bay at daybreak. As for the weather, with him it was always assured. If it rained while he was talking, he would belittle it by saying, Sure, tis but a little bit of a shower. Twon't last ten minutes. Then he would pilot a schooner over the bar and disappear. But after all, our host, Sheridan, was a kindly, good-natured fellow, and very accommodating. He had told his tales so often that he really believed them, and was not so much to blame as one would think at first sight. His wife was a most capable manager, and largely made up for his shortcomings in the fulfilment of promises. Cade Mila Falcha, a hundred thousand welcomes, was emblazoned on a large crescent over the door. The place was well supplied with pets, cats, dogs, and a tame cow making up the family. The house has four pairs of stairs leading from the hall vestibule. There is a high mountain close to its rear, and another right in front of it, with the Atlantic to the west, so that it must be described as a picturesque establishment in every detail. The weather became foggy, and we were about to leave without trying to see anything, when the sun suddenly broke through the clouds, and we changed the programme by remaining. Ackle Island is fifteen miles long by twelve miles wide. It is bounded by Blacksod Bay on the north, and by Clew Bay on the south. There is a small grocery store on the west side of the island, which is said to be the nearest saloon to America, and proud is the owner of this distinction. The people lead a very peculiar life. The latitude is high, and consequently, in the dead of winter, the day is very short, and they cannot fish in the stormy waters surrounding the island. They save enough money in summer to carry them through the winter months and amuse themselves during the long nights by dancing. Every community has its fiddler, and it is his business to provide a house with a large room in which the dances can be held. Each family furnishes the supper in turn, and all pay the fiddler. One would suppose that whisky would play the leading part in such entertainments, and up to the latter part of the last century it did. But it is now entirely absent Long experience taught the participants that if peaceful family parties were to be indulged in, the Mountain Jew must be an absentee. So they took to Guinness Stout, and the piles of empties everywhere to be seen show clearly that the Guinness shares are a valuable investment. This dancing is carried on in most of the northwestern counties, where the winter days are short. The balls end at 3 a.m., and the dancers sleep till eleven the next morning. The island contains the cathedral cliffs of Minon, one thousand feet in height, hollowed by the long action of the waves through countless centuries, and having a striking resemblance to stupendous Gothic isles. We started early in the morning for Acklehead via Keem Bay, travelling as usual on a car driven by a boy we drove through a unique fishing village, consisting of very small houses laid out in regular streets, and thatched roofs being secured against the winter storms by ropes on which were hung large stones about the size of watermelons. These rows of stones swayed in the wind, and produced a curious effect while in motion. The car stopped at the foothills, where the road changed into a path and waited under a shed for our return in the evening. On alighting, we were delighted to hear the sweet, familiar sound of a pair of larks that soared up under the clear blue sky, so far above our heads that they seemed mere speckles, which we could see but indistinctly. 
It was many years since we had seen and heard the Irish lark in its native element, and we listened to the notes with keen, reminiscent pleasure. Here we hired two gillies to help us in climbing Ackle Head, which is quite a high mountain. We climbed up a steep track for about three miles, and were congratulating ourselves upon our progress when, on rounding the hip of the hill, we discovered that we should have to descend again to sea level at Keem Bay in order to commence the real ordeal. It was easy work going down, and we soon reached the bay. This is a beautiful spot, an indenture in the headland, with a firm yellow strand at the head and perpendicular rocky buffs on its sides. Three large boats were salmon fishing, and from the many places where we rested on our long climb up the mountain, we saw them tacking back and forth all day. Near the shore we visited the house and store of Captain Boycott, both in ruins. This is the gentleman who gave us a new word for our vocabulary. Notwithstanding his fate, he had many warm friends among the peasantry. We started climbing again by following the bed of a brawling stream, and adhered to it until it turned into a rivulet. Most Irish mountains are formed by a series of benches, and our plan was to climb briskly till we reached a bench and there make a recovery for the next assault. As we rose in the air we felt our clothing becoming burdensome and we gave one article after another to the gillies, so that by the time we reached the top our wardrobes were quite elementary. It seemed to us that all the benches in Ireland were collected on that mountain. Each one was to have been last, but still there was another and yet another. We finally reached the summit and bathed in perspiration lay down on the heather, wrapping ourselves in raincoats and telling the gillies to wake us in an hour, fell asleep. It would not have been much of a climb for a mountaineer, but for us, of full habit and totally untrained, it was exercised to the extreme limit of endurance. When we awoke, we crawled on all fours to the edge of the head and looked over, and we shall never forget the sight that greeted our eyes. Ackle Head and Crohan Mountain adjoining it have the reputation of being the highest marine cliffs in existence. They are poised over the Atlantic at an angle of 60 degrees, and the peculiar point on which we lay far overhung the ocean. Here lightning-splintered pinnacles shoot from the mass. Savage, titanic rocks lie on the face of the two mountains in wild confusion, scarred and rent from top to bottom, and the blue waters surge and break at their base in restless confusion, throwing up the spray to great heights. Then for a moment all is calm, only to begin over again. It was as if the grandest alpine scenery had the Atlantic breaking on its lower levels, and yet it retained the charm of the finest verdure. Between the crevices grew blooming heather, luxuriant ferns, wild flowers, and arbutus in great profusion, while flocks of wild gulls circled gracefully through the air in quest of food, the whole being enveloped in the warm, moist air of the Gulf Stream, rising from the face of the ocean and suffusing the cliffs upon which we rested, giving it practically the temperature of a hothouse. It was always a struggle between the mist and the sun. Each alternatively gained the mastery, and it was this weird kaleidoscope that held us spellbound and presented wonderland in a new guise. The Crohan Mountain, 2,219 feet in height, lay right beside us, joined to Ackle Head by a rocky bridge. Its grand and peculiar feature is that at the very highest point it would seem as if the rest of the mountain had been suddenly cut away, leaving a vast and tremendous precipice descending to the water nearly 1,950 feet. Deep fissures and rocky furrows have been worn by the torrents which pour down after heavy rains. 
and the bottom where it shelves slightly is strewn with boulders and masses of shattered rock forming natural bulwarks against the advancing tide from where we stood the view seaward was of course boundless and the nearest land being america it is doubtful if such another panorama is unfolded from any other height in the british isles far out is the black rock on which is a lighthouse two hundred and sixty-eight feet high and to the northward are north and south inish ski and duvillon the mullet peninsula eris and the ever varying outlines of black sod bay lie spread out like a map and beyond sleeve moor is a network of island and inlet above which the splendid range of the ballycroy hills forms a background in the distance is nephin far to the south rises the rugged head of croke patrick and the mountains round clue bay farther off are the summits of the twelve pins ackle lies immediately below beyond it clare island and farther south inish turk inish boffin inish shark bound the horizon off the mullet are numerous islands of which the principal are inish carrig and inish glora where according to some the dead are subject to such extraordinary and preserving influences that their nails and hair grow as in life so that their descendants to the tenth generation can come and with pious care pared the one and clipped the other the eagle still haunts these clips and wild goats feed almost secure in his last haunts on these islands it was growing late and as we had five miles of walking before us we retraced our steps down the mountain to keem bay the trials of that descent have not been written in sand they will never be forgotten in our exhausted condition we reeled and staggered from hummock to hummock floundered through the soggy bog like a pair of stranded seals sat down in the heather for a few gasps of breath when we could no longer go on we gouged each other gouged the emerald isle and people we sneered at the glory of george's hatchet and concluded that after all king edward's job was not what it was cracked up to be anything to divert our minds from the dreadful present if we could have put ackle island and all its scenery out of commission for ever we would gladly have done but time and the hour run through the roughest day and so we got to the bottom at the beach we saw a cow herd coming towards us with numerous cans and supposing these to be full we pounced upon him for a drink of milk luck was against us again his cans were empty and he told us he had to walk a mile or more to where his cows were grazing before he could fill them we braced ourselves for the final walk around the mountain and as it was a fair road we had little difficulty in reaching the shed where we had left the car in the early morning the driver was watching for us and we gladly swung ourselves up on the seats and no pair of irish kings ever enjoyed riding in royal state more than we did we stopped a few minutes at a lake by the wayside to see some of the hotel guests catching a basket of fine trout which were afterwards served at late supper we awoke next morning stiff and sore but a breezy chat with our genial host soon put us on good terms with ourselves and everything about us we left ackle island in the afternoon deeply regretting that we had not more time to devote to its wonders end of ackle island chapter fifteen of on an irish jaunting car through donegal and connemara by samuel gamble bain this librivox recording is in the public domain Recorded by Frank Lennon Recess to Galway Now, back to Recess, which we left so abruptly. In the evening we went for a circular drive to Ballina Hinch, with its river, lakes and islands, up the river on one side, crossing it on a bridge, and down again, 
by the base of the twelve pins, which you can't get away from in this country. We saw Ballinahinch Castle close to the road on the edge of the lake. It belongs to the celebrated Martins, whose fortunes have been graphically described by Charles Lever in his popular novel, The Martins of Cromartin. They owned 200,000 acres of land, and Colonel Martin is said to have endeavoured to put the Prince Regent of that day out of conceit with the famous Long Walk at Windsor by saying that the avenue which led to his hall door was thirty miles long. The pleasantry was true, for he owned the forty miles of road from Galway to his door. Thackeray was a great admirer of Irish scenery, and wrote profusely about it. These pins were his particular hobby, and he never tired of them. In one book he writes, I won't attempt to pile up big words in place of those wild mountains over which the clouds, as they passed, or the sunshine as it went and came, cast every variety of tint, light, and shadow. All one can do is to lay down the pen and ruminate and cry beautiful once more. Bravo, William, but you ought to have peered over Ackle or have gone in a boat to see the birds at Horn Head. Then we should have heard from you on a really great theme. As we were returning to the hotel, a white automobile approached us at high speed and we could not but admire the dexterous way in which our driver got out of difficulty, for the horse had become panic-stricken and was about to plunge down the embankment along which we were driving. He jumped from his seat, whipped off his coat, and wrapped it around the horse's head. The animal was so much surprised at the novelty of the proceeding and the sudden loss of his sight that he forgot all about the white ghost till it had safely passed us. The chauffeur shouted back, Great work! That's a new patent. At recess we had the pleasure of meeting Mr. W. J. D. Walker, inspector and organiser of industries for the Congested Districts Board. We had a long and interesting reminiscent chat with him regarding other days in Ireland. He is an enthusiast on the subject of helping the poor there to help themselves. The board has employed experts to teach these people the best way to fish, build boats, breed cattle, till and improve the soil, make lace, weave cloth, manufacture baskets, and do so many things of which they have at present but little, if any, knowledge. In fact, they are helped in every way possible by the British government. Galway was nearby, and an agreement was made to join Mr. Walker on one of his tours of inspection of the Aran Islands. So to Galway we went, where we received our first mail since leaving America. After having ascertained that the seaboard bank's doors were still open, glanced at the price of U.S. fours, and noted that the growing strength of the Hackensack Meadows, we set out to see the town. Galway is situated on gently rising ground, on the north side and near the head of the bay. The greater portion of the town is built upon a tongue of land bound on the east by Lochatalia, an arm of the sea, and on the west by the river which forms the outlet of Loch Corrib. The other and smaller part is on the opposite bank of the river and is in the district known as Irconnacht the connection being maintained by one wooden and two stone bridges. The West Bridge is a very ancient structure of date 1342, and formerly possessed two tower gateways at the west and centre. These, however, have long since disappeared. The upper bridge leading from the courthouse was erected in 1818. Under various names, a town has been established here from the very earliest times, and Ptolemy mentions a city called Magnatha or Nagnatha, which is generally considered to be identical with Galway. This last name is derived, according to some, from a legend to the effect that a woman named Galva was drowned in the river by others from the Galicia of Spain. 
with whom the town carried on an extensive trade, and by others again, from the Gales or foreign merchants by whom it was occupied. Nothing is definitely known of Galway until 1124, when, according to the four masters, a fort was erected there by the Connacht men. This was thrice demolished by the Munster men, and as often rebuilt. In 1226, Richard de Burgo was granted the county of Connacht, and, having crushed the O'Connors, established his power in the west. He took Galway in 1232, enlarged the castle, and made it his residence. From this time Galway became a flourishing English colony. Among the new settlers were a number of families whose descendants are known to this day under the general appellation of the tribes of Galway, an expression first invented by Cromwell's forces as a term of reproach against the natives of the town for their singular friendship and attachment to one another during the time of their unparalleled troubles and persecutions, but which the latter afterwards adopted as an honourable mark of distinction between themselves and their cruel oppressors. There were thirteen of these so-called tribes, the descendants of some of which, as Blake, Lynch, Bodkin, Brown, Joyce, Kirwan, Morris, Skerritt, Darcy, French, and Martin, may still be found among its citizens, who in those days carefully guarded themselves from any intercourse with the native Irish. In one of the bylaws of date 1518, it was enacted that no man of this town shall oast or receive into their houses at Christmas, Easter, nor no face else any of the Burks, MacWilliams, the Kellys, nor no crep else without license of the mayor and council on paying to forfeit five pounds that neither O nor Mac shall strut nor swagger through the streets of Galway. The following singular inscription was formerly to be seen over the west gate. From the fury of the O'Flaherty's, good Lord deliver us. Owing to its excellent situation, Galway enjoyed for centuries the monopoly of the trade with Spain, whence it received large quantities of wine and salt, etc., which caused so much personal intercourse that the town became impressed to a certain degree with Spanish features both in the architecture of the streets and in the dress and manners of the population, though it has been nevertheless the habit of former writers to ascribe too much to the supposed Spanish origin of the town, overlooking the fact that it was inhabited by an essentially Anglo-Norman colony. The first character of incorporation was granted by Richard the Second and confirmed in successive reigns down to that of Charles the Second. That of Richard the Second excluded MacWilliam Burke and his heirs from all rule and power in Galway, and the charter of Elizabeth made the mayor admiral of Galway and the bay, including the Aran Islands. Galway reached its highest point of opulence at the commencement of the Irish Rebellion in 1641, during which period it was remarkable for its loyalty to the king. It was surrendered to Ludlow in 1652, having suffered a siege, and such barbarous treatment at the hands of the parliamentary army, that at the restoration the town was almost wholly decayed. From a map made in 1651 by the Marquis of Claricarde to ascertain the extent and value of the town, it appears that Galway was then entirely surrounded by walls, defended by fourteen towers, and entered by as many gates. On July 19, 1691, a week after the Battle of Ockram, Ginkell, with 14,000 men, laid siege to it. Two days later, the town surrendered, the garrison being permitted to evacuate it 
with a safe conduct to Limerick and a pardon to the inhabitants. Since the middle of the last century, the fortifications have gone fast to decay, and now nothing remains but a fragment near the quay and a massive archway leading to Spanish Place. There is also a square bastion of great thickness in Francis Street, and a portion of wall with a round-headed, blocked arch. Within the last century, the town has so much increased as to cover more than double the space formerly occupied within the walls. Some of the houses are built Spanish fashion, with a small court in the centre and an arched gateway leading into the street. The most striking specimen of domestic architecture is Lynch's Mansion, a large square building at the corner of Shop and Abbeygate streets, having square-headed doorways and windows with richly decorated mouldings and dripstones. There is also a portion of the cornice or projecting balustrade at the top of the house, the horizontal supporting pillars being terminated with grotesque heads. On the street face are richly ornamented medallions bearing the arms of the lynches, with their crest a lynx. This castle has more gargoyles and coats of arms carved upon it than ever Mr. Carnegie can hope to cut on the battlements of Skybo. I was going to say the lynches had carvings to burn, but considering the incombustible nature of these ornamentations, the phrase would perhaps be inappropriate. The family of Lynch, one of the most celebrated in Galway annals, is said to have originated from Linz in Austria, of which town one of them was governor during a siege. As a reward for his services, he received permission to take a lynx as a crest. The family came to Ireland in the 13th century and flourished there till the middle of the 17th. In 1484, Pierce Lynch was made first mayor under the new charter of Richard III, while his son Stephen was appointed first warden by Innocent VIII. And during a period of a 169 years, 84 members of this family were mayors. Altogether, the Lynches were great people in Galway. In Market Street, at the back of St. Nicholas's Church, is the Lynch Stone, bearing the following inscription. This memorial of the stern and unbending justice of the chief magistrate of this city, James Lynch Fitzstephen, elected mayor, A.D. 1493, who condemned and executed his own guilty son, Walter, on this spot, has been restored to its ancient site. Below this is a stone with a skull and crossbones, and this inscription. 1524. Remember, debt vaniti of vaniti, and owl is but vaniti. James Lynch Fitzstephen had been one of the most successful of the citizens in promoting commerce with Spain, which he had himself personally visited, having been received with every mark of hospitality. To make some return for all this kindness, he proposed and obtained permission from his Spanish host to take his only son back with him to Ireland. The mayor had also an only son, unfortunately addicted to evil company but who, he hoped, was likely to reform from the circumstance of being attached to a Galway lady of good family. And so it might have proved, had he not jealously fancied, that the lady took too graciously upon the Spaniard. Roused to madness, he watched the latter out of his house, stabbed him, and then, stung with remorse, gave himself up to justice. To his father's unutterable dismay, Notwithstanding the entreaties of the town folk with whom the youth was a favourite, the stern parent passed sentence of death and actually hanged him from the window with his own hand. The Joyces, however, ran the Lynches a close race in Connemara, a part of which is called Joyce's Country. In Abigate Street is the Joyces' mansion, now in ruins. 
on a house in the adjoining street are the arms of Galway. The complete ruins of Stubber Castle are in High Street, the entrance to it being through a shop. The only feature of which worth noticing is a carved chimney piece being the arms of Blake and Brown, 1619. In Market Street are the remains of the Burke's Mansion. The Bay of Galway consists of a long arm of the sea, protected at the entrance by the lofty cliffs of the islands of Arran, which in clear weather are visible at a distance of 29 miles, and on the north and south by the coasts of Galway and Clare, respectively. A legend in the annals of Ireland states that it was once a freshwater lake known as Loch Lurgan, one of the three principal lakes of Ireland, and was converted into a bay by the Atlantic breaking over and uniting with the water therein. A large number of the population is employed in salmon and herring fishery, and the Clada is their home. This is an extraordinary assemblage of low thatched cottages built with total disregard to system and numbered indiscriminately. Hardyman wrote of them as follows. The colony, from time immemorial, has been ruled by one of their own body, periodically elected, who is dignified with the title of mayor, regulates the community according to their own peculiar laws and customs, and settles all their fishery disputes. His decisions are so decisive and so much respected that the parties are seldom known to carry their differences before a legal tribunal or to trouble the civil magistrates. The title and office are now quite obsolete. At one time they never allowed strangers to reside within their precincts and always intermarried among themselves. But now strangers settle among them they are a very moral and religious people. They would not go to sea or away from home on any Sunday or holiday. The dress of the women of the Clada was formerly very peculiar and imparted a singular foreign aspect to the Galway streets and quays. It consisted of a blue mantle, red body gown and petticoat, a handkerchief bound round the head and legs and feet au naturel. But that dress is rarely seen now. The cladder ring, two hands holding a heart, becomes an heirloom in a family and is handed down from mother to daughter. One of the sights of the town is to see the salmon waiting to go up the Galway River to spawn. We rose one morning quite early to see this, when the fish would not be disturbed, and we watched them from the bridge for an hour. It was worth the effort. We saw them packed in schools quivering and jostling one another in their eagerness to get up to the spawning grounds. At our hotel we found an interesting character who served in the capacity of waiter. When questioned on the subject of his past, he said that he had come from Hamburg when twenty years old. He spoke German broken into English with a strong Connemara brogue, and if Weber and Fields could only have heard him describe the items on a carte de jour, he would not be left long in Galway, but would find his opportunity in their dramatic temple on Broadway. End of Recess to Galway Chapter 16 of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon Aran Islands The Aran Isles lie out in the Atlantic, some twenty-nine miles from shore, being visited by a small steamer twice a week. We took passage on the Duras with Mr. Walker one morning soon after our arrival. All kinds of people and a great variety of cargo were on board. We stood out to sea steadily and in a few hours reached what is known as the South Island. Here we dropped anchor for about five hundred yards from shore and commenced unloading our cargo into the sea. 
to be taken care of by a great crowd of curraghs which swarmed about the ship. In explanation, it may be stated that the curragh is a great institution. It is lightly framed, skeleton boat covered with raw cowhide or canvas, and thoroughly tarred, in which the skilled native can go anywhere in all weathers. It is universally used on the coast from Donegal to Connemara. Boards were tossed into the sea, which were quickly gathered together by the curragh men, bound with ropes and towed ashore. We had a drove of pigs on board, and their feet were tied together with ropes, the four in a bunch, and the animals piled up in the curraghs till the boats would hold no more. Then they were taken near the shore, liberated, and allowed to swim to land themselves. Their squealing and grunting was like an untrained Wagnerian band. There was a cow on board, and she was pushed from the gangway by main strength, plunging headlong into the waves. There was a short pause when she reappeared, swam ashore, shook herself, and unconcernedly began eating grass, none the worse for her bath. Mr. Walker took a snapshot of her, reaching land. We are also indebted to this fine photographer for the many excellent views he took for us in this locality and on the mainland. Then there were all sorts of other things piled into the curraghs, and lastly, we too managed to get into one, and were rowed ashore. Mr. Walker then took us to a lace-making school, which his board had established on the island, and we saw the young girls making fine laces in a neat building that had at one time been a church. The instructress had been on the island for more than a year, and Mr. Walker at once gave her a much-needed vacation. Standing on the shore, I asked the man, Are there many lobsters here? Sure the shores is red with em, your honour, in the height of the season, was his reply. We again got into a curragh, boarded the steamer, and were under way in a trice for Aaron Moore, the largest island of the group where we landed an hour later at a fine pier built by the congested district's board. The village is called Kilronan, and the inhabitants live by fishing. They are a simple and peculiar people, descended from the fair bullocks, retaining some parts of the dress and many of the customs of that race. Their footwear consists of a coarse stocking, over which they wear a tight-fitting slipper of raw cowhide with the hair on it, called a pamputi. This is a special shoe for use on the smooth and slippery rocks of these islands. They also wear a snug, homespun flannel jacket and a short pants, the whole making an extraordinarily picturesque and effective outfit for their work. They have no pockets for handkerchiefs, cigars, eyeglasses, gloves, or even small change, but they seem to get along very well without them. There is a cable to the island, and we had wired to Mrs. O'Brien's cottage for a dinner, there being no hotel. This was ready on our arrival, and having finished it, we took the only car on the island and drove out to Doon, or Fort Angus described by Dr. Petrie as the most magnificent barbaric monument now extant in Europe. Its gigantic proportions, isolated position, and the wild scenery by which it is surrounded render the trouble of the journey to see it well worth while. It is built on the very edge of sheer cliffs, 250 to 300 feet in height, forming the south and east sides. In form it is of horseshoe shape, Although some antiquarians incline to the belief that it was originally oval and that it acquired its present form from the falling of the precipices, it consists of three enclosures and the remains of a fourth. The wall which surrounds the innermost is 18 feet high and 12 feet 9 inches thick. It is in three sections, the inner one 7 feet high and like the others has the centre wall lower than the faces. This enclosure measures 150 feet from north to south and 140 feet from east to west. 
The doorway is four feet eight inches high and three feet five inches wide, very slightly inclining, and the lintel is five feet ten inches long. In the northwest side is a passage leading into the body of the wall. The second rampart, which is not concentric, encloses a space about 400 feet by 300. Outside the second wall is the usual accompaniment of a very large entanglement, 30 feet wide, formed of sharp stones placed on end and sunk in the ground to hinder the approach of the enemy for an assault on the fort and make them an easy target for the bowmen to shoot at. So effective was this entanglement that we experienced considerable difficulty in getting through it, and when we did accomplish that feat, we felt fully qualified to appreciate the intrepidity of an attacking party who would brave such an obstruction to their progress when storming the fort. Inside these stones to the west is a small enclosure, the wall of which is seven feet nine inches high and six feet thick. Outside of it all is a rampart, now nearly destroyed, enclosing a space of eleven acres. These walls terminate at both ends of the south cliffs. About the first century of the Christian era, three brothers, Angus, Concobar, and Mill, came from Scotland to Arran, and their names are still preserved in connection with buildings on the island. The ancient fort just described being called Dunangus, the great fort of the Middle Island, superior in strength and preservation to the former, bearing the name of Dun Connor, or Con Cahobar, and the name of Mill being associated with the low strand of Port Mervey, formerly known as the Mervey Mill, or the Sea Plain of Mill. The surface of the ground surrounding Dunangus is most remarkable. It is a level sheet of blue limestone extending for many miles in every direction. This cracked when cooling into rectangular forms, and in these cracks grow large ferns, the only vegetation to be seen. The mass of stone retains the sun's heat during the night, and consequently these ferns are most luxuriant. It would perhaps prove monotonous to describe in detail all the churches, forts, beehive cells, and monastic ruins, in many cases constructed in cyclopean masonry, with which these islands are literally covered. For it must be remembered that Ireland, in the early ages, was the University of Europe, the chief resort of the literati, where scholars came to learn and to teach each other all that was then known and their numbers were so great that many buildings were required for their accommodation. The wonder of it all is why these isolated islands should have been selected as the seat of learning, when so many other convenient sites could have been chosen. The men who decided the matter seem to have thought that islands so far removed from the mainland would offer seclusion and better protection from the various wars that had drenched Ireland in blood for so many centuries. I shall therefore content myself with what is above stated regarding Dunangus, the largest and most important structure on the islands. Passing over the tradition of Loch Lurgan, the earliest reference to the pre-Christian history of the Aran Islands is to be found in the accounts of the Battle of Murdiek, in which the fair Bullogs, having been defeated by the Danon, were driven from refuge into Arran, and also other islands off the Irish coast, as well as into the western islands of Scotland. Christianity was introduced in the 5th century by St. Ende, Eni or Endeus, who obtained a grant of the islands from Angus, the Christian king of Munster, and founded ten religious establishments. Arran Moore speedily obtained a world-wide renown, for learning, piety, and aestheticism, and many hundreds of holy men from other parts of Ireland and foreign countries constantly resorted to it to study the sacred scriptures and to learn and practice the rigid austerities of a hermit's life, in consequence of which the island was distinguished 
by the name of Aranave or Ara of the Saints. A century ago a curious custom prevailed in these islands. When a body was being carried to the grave, a convenient spot was selected at which to rest the pallbearers. Here the funeral procession came to a halt, generally about one hundred yards from the road. This spot was afterwards used as a site for a monument erected by husband, wife or family, as the case may be, which for the most part took the place of a monument in the graveyard. When the relatives possessed means, these memorials became quite imposing, bearing carved statuary and having a short history of the dead inscribed on them, winding up with a formula invoking a blessing on the souls of the departed. We left the car to inspect a low row of these stones fronting on the main road from Kilronan to Donengus. The quaint things said in praise of the dead were quite interesting. Many of the natives on Thursday and Friday in Holy Week still make a pilgrimage round Arran Moor, a distance of twenty miles, performing religious exercises at each church in the circuit. The O'Briens were lords of Arran from an early period, but were driven out by the O'Flaherty's of Ir Connacht, who in turn were driven out by the English in 1587. In 1651, the Marquis of Clarincard fortified the castle of Arklin, the stronghold of the O'Briens, which held out against the parliamentary army for more than a year after the surrender of Galway. But on the occupation of the island, the soldiers of Cromwell demolished the great church of St. Enda to furnish materials for the repair of the strong fort. On the surrender of Galway in 1691, Arran was garrisoned and remained so for many years. Aaron gives the title of Earl to the Gore family. At his home we met Father Farragher, a genial gentleman and the parish priest of Kilronan, and he gave us a great deal of interesting information concerning the history and life of these islands, which are historic to the degree rarely met with and with which he was thoroughly familiar. We returned late in the evening by steamer to Galway. When going to bed at the hotel, I summoned our comic boots and directed him to call number 41 at six o'clock. The boots wrote the call on his slate, then sat down with a puzzled expression on his face. Noticing this, I inspected the slate and found that the inscription read, Call 46 at one. He excused his blunder by saying, Sure, you Yankees do be giving us such queer orders these days. We're prepared for almost anything. On leaving on the train the next morning, and after we were seated in a crowded carriage, this same man put his head in through the open window and shouted, You owe us another shilling. The mistress forgot to charge the brace of nightcaps he had before bedtime. End of Aran Islands Chapter 17 of On an Irish Jaunting Car through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon. Limerick. The important part of our trip being finished, Mr. Ross left for London to witness the second attempt at the coronation of King Edward, while I went down to see Limerick and visit its annual horse fair. Arrived at Limerick, I found the town full of the horsiest men I had ever seen anywhere. They had the knack of horsey dressing down to a fine point. Horseshoe pins were the thing, stuck in light-coloured scarves wound around their necks. Their shanks were tightly rolled in leather, and above the knee they wore Santos Dumont balloons, in colours that would have made a rainbow look like a band of crepe. Most of them had the conventional blade of grass in their mouths, a fashion started by Lord Palmerston five years ago and immortalized by John Leach in a celebrated punch cartoon of that period. When looking at a horse, they tilted their hats far back into the nape of their necks, planted their feet wide apart, stuffed their hands into their pockets, and carried themselves with the general air of one who soliloquizes. 
well i'm just looking for a photograph of a man who can away with me on a horse trade several streets in the horsey quarter of the town were given up to showing horses and there were examples of every breed size colour and weight you could think of including hunters carriage horses racers saddle horses utility nags circus horses and ponies the rushing rearing plunging galloping trotting and loping of the horses and the shouting of the rough riders made a kaleidoscopic scene of dust noise and confusion which would have caused any suffering from nervous prostration to choose some other place for a quiet afternoon but i was there to see it through and i went into the spirit of the occasion for all i was worth trying my best to lend a helping hand in many of the trades i was on the successful side twice and had a glass of limerick ale at a neighbouring bar with the elated buyers the dealing swapping and buying were carried on in true artistic style while the rough riding when showing the animals can only be seen in ireland it takes a buyer a seller and about three cappers on each side to close a trade they almost pull the clothes off the back of the owner and slap him violently on various parts of his body when splitting differences a buyer always bids about five pounds more than he will really give stipulating that he shall have the five pounds returned to him after the purchase this swells the apparent value of the nag and pleases the owner he tells his neighbours that he sold his horse for the larger amount but they know that he didn't get it so there's no harm done a dealer suddenly slapped me on the back and said why don't you buy a fine pair for yourself and take him to the states with ye oh the horse is not in it any longer in america the automobile is king ah the divil burn the automobiles anyhow no decent man will ride in one of em if he can't get a state behind a horse was his prompt reply young well-matched carriage pairs brought one hundred and fifty guineas readily during the afternoon why don't you ship some of these teams to america you could get three thousand dollars for them in new york was a question i was put to another dealer i know it sir but the risk and expenses are too big it would break me up in the long run and i suppose he was right after saying so much about the horse fair perhaps it might be as well to say something about limerick itself limerick has had quite a past and there has been a hot time in the old town about as often as in any other city that can be pointed out it is situated in a broad plain watered by the shannon and backed up in the distance by the hills of Clare and Killaloo. The river, which soon becomes an estuary, rolls in a magnificent and broad stream through the heart of the town, and sends off a considerable branch called the Abbey River. This branch, rejoining the Shannon further north, encloses what is known as the King's Island, on the southern portion of which is built the English Tower, united to the mainland by three bridges, and containing the most ancient buildings in contradiction is the irish town which lies to the south of it and more in the direction of the railway station these two districts comprise the fortified old town up to edward the second's time only the english town had been defended by walls and towers but these were subsequently extended so as to include the irish town which was entered by st john's gate the eastern portion of the walls in parts forty-five feet is still fairly preserved newtown perry the district between this and the river was then bare but having come into the possession of the perry family earls of limerick it was specially built upon and is now equal to any city in ireland for the breadth and cleanliness of its streets of these the principal is george's street a handsome thoroughfare of nearly a mile in length giving off others on each side at right angles with a statue of o'connell by hogan erected in eighteen fifty seven at the south end of it in richmond place there is also to the north a monument to the memory of lord montagill the name limerick is derived from the irish limnach the name of a portion of the shannon 
by the corruption of the N to the R. Like most of the Irish seaports, it was founded in the ninth century by the Danes, who were subdued by Brian Boru when he assumed the sovereignty over Munster and Limerick, thus became the royal city of the Munster kings. After passing through the usual stages of intercene native war, its next important epoch was marked by the erection of a strong fortress by King John, who committed the care of it to the charge of William de Burke. Bruce took it in 1316 and remained there for some months. From that time, with a few intervals of check, it steadily gained in importance until the reign of Elizabeth, when it was made the centre of civil and military administration. In 1641, it held out for some time against the Irish, but was taken by them. It was defended in 1651 by Hugh O'Neill against Irithan during a six months siege. Here, next year, Irithan died of the plague. But the great episode in the history of Limerick took place during the wars of William and James, when the events occurred which fastened on it the name of the city of the violated treaty. After the fall of Athlone and Galway, Tyrconnell, the Lord Lieutenant, still held Limerick as the last stronghold that King James possessed, the city having been previously unsuccessfully assaulted by the English under William at the head of about 26,000 men in 1690. Lazun, the French general, said it could be taken with roasted apples, and leaving it to its fate, went to Galway and embarked for France. William's army was wanting in artillery, and he awaited the arrival of a heavy siege train from Dublin. The convoy was arrested by Sarsfield, who started at night with 600 horsemen on the Clare side and crossed the Shannon at Killaloo. The next night he fell on them and took possession of the train. He filled the cannon with powder, buried their mouths in the earth, and, firing the hole, utterly destroyed them. More cannon arrived from Waterford, and William pressed forward the siege. On the 27th of August, a breach having been effected, a terrific assault was made, lasting four hours, in which the women of Limerick were conspicuous in the defence. The besiegers were repulsed, losing about 2,000 men. In consequence of the swampy nature of the ground and the advanced season, William raised the siege. A fit of apoplexy carried off Tyrconnell, when the government, both civil and military, fell into the hands of Duzon and Sarsfield. Ginkell, commander of the English army, endeavoured to take the town by an attack on the fort which overlooked and protected the Thomond Bridge. This attack is described in graphic and spirited language by Lord Macaulay, and I cannot do better than give the account of it in his own words. In a short time the fort was stormed. The soldiers who had garrisoned it fled in confusion to the city. The town major, a French officer, who commanded at the Thomond Gate, afraid that the pursuers would enter with the fugitives, ordered that part of the bridge which was nearest to the city be drawn up. Many of the Irish went headlong into the stream and perished there. Others cried for quarter and held up their handkerchiefs in token of submission, but the conquerors were mad with rage. Their cruelty could not be immediately restrained, and no prisoners were made till the heads of corpses rose above the parapet. The garrison of the fort had consisted of about 800 men. Of these, only 120 escaped into Limerick. The result of this capture was the fall of James's power in Ireland and the signing of the famous treaty on the stone near the bridge on October the 3rd, 1691, the ninth article of which provided that the Roman Catholics should enjoy the same privileges of their religion as they enjoyed in the reign of Charles the Second, and that William and Mary would endeavour to ensure them immunity from disturbance on account of their religion. This article, however, was never carried into effect, although through no fault of the Williams. Large numbers 
of the Irish soldiers took service under France and formed the Irish Brigade, famous in after years in continental wars. Sarsfield was killed at the Battle of Landon in 1693, and it has been estimated that in the next half century 450,000 Irishmen died in the French service. For 70 years after the siege, the city was maintained as a fortress, and its ramparts and gates kept in repair and guarded. In 1760 it was abandoned as such, its defences dismantled, and the city thus freed, rapidly extending its boundaries. It has since, however, been a station for large detachments of troops, and is, at the present day, one of the most bustling and pleasant garrison towns. The Shannon is crossed by three important bridges, of which the Thomond Bridge, built in 1839, claims priority from its ancient associations. It connects English Town and the County of Clare, the entrance from which, through Thomond Gate, was protected by the fort mentioned above and King John's Castle. It is one of the finest Norman fortresses in the kingdom and has a river front of about 200 feet, flanked by two massive drum towers 50 feet in diameter. The walls are of great strength, being 10 feet thick. The northern tower is the most ancient, and from the bridge traces of the cannonading it received in its various sieges can be clearly seen. It still remains its ancient gateway, but the modern entrance is from Nicholls Street. Its venerable appearance is marred by the addition of the modern roofs and buildings of the barracks, into which the interior was converted in 1751. The constableship of the castle was only abolished in 1842. The treaty stone, on which the famous treaty was signed in 1691, is at the western end of the bridge. It was set upon its present pedestal in 1865. Limerick is famed for the fineness of its laces, and at one time its gloves were the most costly in the market. Last but not least, it is still famous for the beauty of its women, a reputation not undeserved, as may be seen even on a casual stroll through the streets. End of Limerick Team of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Frank Lennon Cork and Queenstown After the Limerick Fair was over, I left for Cork and arrived there just in time to see the race for the International Cup, presented by Lord O'Brien, and won by the Leander Crew of London. There were a hundred thousand people on the banks of the River Lee to see the race, and strange to say, Cork went wild over an English victory. Next day I visited the Cork exhibition. It had, like all minor exhibitions of the kind, pyramids of manufactured articles, including the making of various commodities by machinery on the spot. But there were a good concert band and a fine restaurant. I also dropped into the Supreme Court and heard the Lord Chief Justice of Ireland stop the court proceedings to read aloud a telegram from Emperor William, as well as his reply in regard to the result of the boat race. Imperial and Milesian taffy flowed freely in both. Truly, Ireland is the land of sport. Later on I attended the Cork steeplechase. There were five events on the card. The jumps were difficult, and one horse was killed, while two or three others met with accidents. I suppose, as we are now on the last lap, it would hardly be fair to Cork and Queenstown to pass them over without noticing them historically. So, if the reader will pardon me, I will take up a little more of his time to sketch briefly the salient features of these two very interesting and ancient towns. Cork is a mixture of some fine streets, broad quays, and many ill-paved lanes. The whole 
being set off by a charming frame of scenery that compensates for many a defect. It is a county and a city with a population of 97,281 and is well situated on the Lee, as Spencer thus describes, the spreading Lee that, like an island fair, encloseth Cork with his divided flood. As it emerges from a wooded and romantic valley upon a considerable extent of flat alluvial ground in its course over which it divides. The land, thus formed, commences about one mile above the town, is enclosed by the north and south channels of the river, and contains a large portion of the city. In 1689, says Macaulay, the city extended over one-tenth part of the space which it now covers, and was intersected by muddy streams which had long been concealed by arches and buildings. A desolate marsh in which the sportsman who pursued the waterfowl sank deep in water and mire at every step covered the area now occupied by stately buildings, the palaces of great commercial societies. Cork has over four miles of quays, and large sums of money have been spent in harbour improvements. Vessels drawing twenty feet of water can discharge at all stages of the tide. The earliest notice of the town dates from the time of St. Finbar, who flourished about the seventh century. He founded an ecclesiastical establishment on the south side of the chief channel of the Lee, and it ultimately attained a high reputation among the schools of Ireland. Then the Danes, after repeatedly plundering it, took a fancy to settling down here themselves, and carried on a somewhat flourishing commerce until the Anglo-Norman invasion. At that time the ruling power was in the hands of Dermot McCarthy, Lord of Desmond, who promptly made submission to Henry the Second on his arrival in 1172, and did him homage. For a long period the English held the place against the Irish, living in a state of almost perpetual siege. They were compelled, Holinshed says, to watch their gates hourly, to keep them shut at service time, at meals, from sun to sun, nor suffer any stranger to enter the city with his weapon, but the same to leave at a lodge appointed. Camden also describes it as a little trading town of great resort, but so beset by rebellious neighbours as to require a constant watch as if continually besieged. Cork took an active part in the disturbed history of the Middle Ages. It declared for Perkin Warbeck, and the mayor, John Walters, was hanged for abetting his pretensions. It was made the headquarters of the English forces during the Desmond Rebellion. In 1649 it surrendered to Cromwell, who, it is said, ordered the bells to be melted for military purposes, saying that since gunpowder was invented by a priest, he thought the best use of the bells would be to promote them into cannon. A noticeable event in its history was the siege by William the Third's army under Marlborough and the Duke of Württemberg. When the garrison surrendered after holding out five days, the Duke of Grafton was killed on this occasion. Numerous monastic establishments were founded in early times, nearly all traces of which, as well as its walls and castles, have been swept away. In the southwestern district of the city is the old cathedral, small and very unlike what a cathedral should be. St. Finbar, the founder of the cathedral, was born in the neighborhood of Bandon, and died at Cloyne in 630. His first religious establishment was in an island in Loch Guganbarra, but about the beginning of the 7th century he founded another on the south bank of the Lee, which became the nucleus of the city of Cork. He was buried here in his own church, and his bones were subsequently enshrined in a silver case, but these relics were carried away by Dermot O'Brien when he plundered the city in 1089. There is little of general interest in the subsequent history of the sea. In 1690, at the siege of Cork, a detachment of English troops took possession 
of the cathedral and attacked the south fort from the tower. The cathedral was so much damaged that it was taken down in 1734 and another erected. With the exception of the tower, which was believed to have formed part of the old church, it was a modern Doric building with a stumpy spire of white limestone. The mode in which the funds were raised for its erection was the levying of a tax on all the coal imported for five years. This building stood until 1864, when it was taken down in order to erect the present structure upon its site. The cannonball fired during the siege of 1690 was found in the tower, 40 feet from the ground, and is now on a bracket within the cathedral. In laying the foundations, three district burial places were found, one above the other, and the human remains found exhibited remarkable racial peculiarities. St. Anne Shandon Church is at the foot of Church Street, off Shandon Street, at the north side of the city. It was built in 1722, and is remarkable for its extraordinary tower, 120 feet high, surmounted by a graduated turret of three stories, faced on two sides with red stone and on the other with limestone. Party coloured like the people, red and white stands Shandon steeple. It contains a peal of bells immortalised by Father Prout in the famous lyric, The bells of Shandon that sound so grand, the pleasant waters of the River Lee. They bear the inscription, We were all cast at Gloucester in England. Abel Rudal, 1750. Father Prout is buried in the churchyard of Shandon. Shandon derived its name, Shandun, Old Fort. The name was given to the Church of St. Mary from its near neighbourhood to Shandon Castle, an old seat of the Barrys. On the way down to Queenstown we passed Passage West, a pretty village embosomed in woods and a considerable place of call, both for travellers and others bound up and down the river. Father Prout had sung its praises. The town of Passage is both large and spacious, and situated upon the Say. Is nate the decent and quite adjacent to come from Cork on a summer's day? There you may slip in and take a dip in, for in the shipping that at anchor ride, or in a wherry cross a ferry to carry the low on the other side. Near here is Monkstown where Anastasia Gould, wife of John Artecan, while her husband was absent in foreign land, determined to afford him a pleasant surprise by presenting him a castle on his return, she engaged workmen and made an agreement with them that they should purchase food and clothing solely from herself. When the castle was completed, on balancing her accounts of receipt and expenditure, she found that the latter had exceeded the former by four pence. Probably this is the first example on record of truck practice on a large scale. She died in 1689 and was buried in the ground of the adjoining ruined church of Temple Owen Bryn, in which is a monument to her memory. Queenstown extends for a considerable distance along the northern coast of the harbour, and from its fine situation and the mildness of its climate ranks high among the southern watering places. Queen Victoria landed here on August 3, 1849, of which she has written as follows. To give the people the satisfaction of calling the place Queenstown, in honour of its being the first spot on which I set foot upon Irish ground, I stepped on the shore amidst the roar of cannon and the enthusiastic shouts of the people. We visited many banks at various towns during our trip and were courteously received with the managers. The Irish banks are managed on the branch system, Belfast and Dublin being the headquarters for the parent corporations. Belfast for the most part takes care of the northern part of the island and Dublin the southern these institutions are very prosperous and are conservatively managed 
by intelligent men. Banks are established in all towns of any importance, and where the population is large, they usually have numbered half a dozen. At Queenstown, we went on board the Cunard steamer Etruria on Sunday morning, bound for New York. The company's popular agent, Mr. E. Dean, obtained the captain's cabin for me on the upper deck and in many other ways killed me with kindness. On looking back, I find that my highest expectations of the trip were all fulfilled, and I have nothing but pleasant memories in connection with it. There were, of course, some bad moments, and for that matter bad days, but they are all forgotten in the recollection of the kindly Irish people and the interesting land in which they live. I cannot recall a single cross word or hard look given me by any one during the entire trip, excepting in the dirty customs. That doesn't count. We travelled over 350 miles on jaunting cars, making use of 23 of them. We travelled the counties of Donegal, Leitrim, Sligo, Mayo and Clare, and used some ten different boats and steamers in completing our journey. To the readers of this very imperfect sketch, I would say that should they ever think of following in our footsteps, they should fully consider the drawbacks and inconveniences incident to the journey before deciding to start. They will meet with wet days, some cheerless damp hotels, and sometimes poor cooking. They will probably not be able to get on as quickly or conveniently as I did, for I was born in Ireland and know the ways of the country and its people. But if they have in them the innate desire to see some of the finest natural scenery in the world, and by all odds the greatest display of verdure in all its varying shades and colours, then perhaps they may risk the many disappointing conditions that must be overcome if they would see Ireland at its best. Immortal little island, no other land or clime, has placed more deathless heroes in the pantheon of time. End of Cork and Queenstown End of On an Irish Jaunting Car Through Donegal and Connemara by Samuel Gamble Bain